Hello, everyone, and welcome back uh, to Mormon Stories Podcast. I'm your host, John DeLynn. It's May 14th, 2021. And today we are following up with part two in a very important five-part series with uh, a newly, not, not newly discovered, but kind of a uh, a newly met for the first time and discovered in terms of their brilliance, Luna Lindsay Corbden. Uh, the book that we are reviewing in a five-part series is this phenomenal book, uh, Recovering Agency, Lifting the Veil of Mormon Mind Control, um, available on Amazon and elsewhere. We spent three hours with with Luna uh, earlier earlier this week. Uh, Luna, I forgot to ask you about your second COVID vaccine. Uh, so I'll, I'll ask you about that in just a second, but, All right. um, what Luna has done is something really important. Luna has spent a lot of time immersing themselves in the, uh, in the social psychology literature to understand how high demand organizations, uh, wield or, or elicit undue influence on their followers and Luna has uh, pulled together what Luna calls the 31 flavors of undue influence, or at least that's what I'm calling them. And uh, it is just so powerful. We covered about six of those in part one. And in each of those, these five parts, we're going to be covering um, five, five or six of these um, uh, elements that Luna has uncovered. And I, I ended my last episode by saying, you know, we, we know about Grant Palmer. We know about Michael Quinn. We know about, uh, Joanna Brooks and Fawn Brody and RFM and Bill Real and Lindsay Hansa Park. And there's so many people that have been very influential on us in, in the Mormon mind space. And I think Luna, uh, without, uh, attempting to love bomb, which we'll describe later or flatter, Luna, I think the work that Luna has done here uh, belongs in, in that realm of of importance. Um, so, without any further ado, we have Lindsay. We're so happy to have you back on Mormon Stories podcast. Thank you for joining us. Hi, thanks a lot. Happy to be here. Um, okay, how was your second COVID vaccine? That was rough. Uh, yeah, my, day two of that, I just kind of felt like I wasn't. It wasn't quite like I had the flu, but it almost was. No specific, like a little slightly fevery, a little achy, and just like no energy. Um, yeah. But it passed on the on the third day, and uh, and here I am. It's fourth, on the fourth day out now. My arm's still a little bit bruised, but oh, yeah. I'm glad you made it through, and I'm glad you got back vaccinated. <laughs> yeah, and I'm free now, so I'm yeah. planning on getting a haircut next week. And Yay. my parents are vaccinated. They were the biggest worry for a while because they're definitely in the risk group. And um, I think my son probably is. I think we're all in uh, the risk group for immuno type things. So it's it's. Ha I'm happy to finally feel like free from that, safe from it. So I love yeah. it. Well, yeah. glad. Well, thanks for joining us again. Listeners, we're going to do around two and a half-ish hours, maybe two hours and 45 minutes today um, as we cover these next topics. And I'm not going to I'm not gonna review what we covered in part one because I saw that's baked into your slides. There's going to be a slide about what we covered last time just as a brief review and then what we're going to be covering this time. So without any further ado, Lindsay, uh, Luna. Luna, sorry, um, <laughs> let's dive into this really important book. I want to ask all my listeners, please stop. Go to Amazon, buy this book, Recovering Agency. You will want this as a resource. Just the bibliography alone is so powerful and important. Um, but Luna, uh, let's talk about uh, part two of your five-part discussion. W where do we go from here? All right. Um, do we want to do a real quick intro? We, we did a full intro last time, um, but just for people who didn't catch the first yeah. one. Yeah. Um, so I was born in the church. Um, there, there is a slide for this if people are more visual. And by the way, we are going to try to describe a lot of these slides for people who are um, just listening or um, people with visual impairments. So um, uh, I was born in the church. I uh, lived for 26 years before I left the church. Um, I, before I got into this, um, if you can call it a career, uh, I was, I worked for 14 years in the computer industry. Um, I am a writer. Um, I am currently working for a living as a freelance ghostwriter. 
Um, and I also write fiction and I've written this book, um, blog posts, various uh, technical writing. Um, I am uh, in the LGBTQIA group. I'm specifically gender fluid and go by they, them pronouns. And I'm bisexual. Um, I am an abuse survivor and I am autistic and um, I have PTSD and I'm disabled. Um, I'm a psych nerd, but I don't have a related degree. So just putting that little pin in that. Um, so no one has approved of me and said, you know, uh, you have done the work here, go have a degree. Um, I'm just really into this stuff. Uh, and um, because of that, I wrote a book about LDS control tactics. I love it. Well, we're so glad to have you back. And uh, you are so strong and um, and effective. And the fact that that you like like all of us, but probably in, in very important, unique ways, you've had you've you've exhibited so much resilience with all of the things life has thrown at you is really inspiring to me. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. So the all next right. slide is the cover of my book. There. Uh, there is a name change. You might notice that the copy you were holding up, John, has Luna Lindsay, um, Luna Lindsay Corbden. Um, unfortunately, when you're coded as female, you take on the name of your person. And I don't really associate my name with him anymore because um, he wasn't a good person. And uh, so that that explains why I used to go by Luna Lindsay. And now I'm Luna Corbden or Luna Lindsay Corbden. I keep the name in there just so people don't lose track. For continuity. Anyway. For continuity. Try not to confuse too yeah. many people. <laughs> um, Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So support this book. Okay. Yeah. And this is the yeah. slide that tells, I guess it's blue for what we covered last time. Mm -hmm. And then red for what we're covering this time. Is that right? That is correct. So um, real briefly, last time we covered, um, you asked me if there was an order to these and there kind of sort of is. Um, so last time we covered the the topics that I thought were like the most essential core to being um, to, to the control mechanisms, um, some of the most harmful ones, although they're all somewhat harmful. Um, and so we covered sacred science demand for purity, doctrine over self, black and white thinking, blame reversal, and guilt and shame. Um, and this week, we're going to cover, these are the ones that sort of pull you in. Um, and so that starts with love bombing, destabilization, deception, belief follows behavior, public commitment, creating dependency, and emotion over intellect. Yeah, and I, I, I actually, this time in advance, did a bit of an inventory and I, I think I'm trying to give a grade to the to the Mormon Church for each of these techniques. And so far, unfortunately, it's gotten an A plus in all all the ones we've covered so far. Mm -hmm. And it's not it's not looking super good for the church uh, today. <laughs> and and that's one thing I would like to point out is um, all of these techniques I didn't originate any of them. These yeah. were discovered by other researchers who've been working in the field since the 50s and 60s when they began the fields when um, uh, Korean prisoners of war were coming back from Korea, U.S. prisoners of war, and they studied the brainwashing techniques used by the Chinese military against them and sort of looked at which prison camps worked, which one, which ones didn't, which, which prisoners were just faking their belief and which ones took a while to um, wean themselves off of those beliefs and which techniques worked and which ones didn't. And surprisingly, torture and um, browbeating people into saying something under duress didn't really work work to change the individual. But when they did little steps, um, we were going to reference a couple of those later on in today's talk, um, they found that that actually convinced people and changed people. And then in the 60s, um, the new religious movement started up a lot of, you know, transcendental meditation and P uh, people's temple, which was the Jonestown, um, all of these little, you know, some of them were harmless, some of them were less harm, uh, less harm, sorry, more harmful and less harmful. And they found that, um, you know, parents were ha losing their children. Um, they would just literally, their children would just be off the, off the map. They would go to college and then they would join some group and then they would just be gone to some compound somewhere. And so they started studying, uh, studying those. And that's and we, what we have today. So, yeah. So and, and, and if I can just give one quick, uh, it's sort of a disclaimer, but it's also trying to be super fair I, we mentioned last time that these are techniques that are not just used by high demand religions. They're not just used by the Mormon church and they're not just used by high demand religions. 
They're used by the military. They're used by corporations. They're used by therapy groups. Mm -hmm. They're used by unhealthy family systems. Uh, you know, corporations, there are just so many ways that these techniques should be applied. I actually want, if I ever help with an organization again, I want to use these te techniques, these, these uh, flavors, as you call them, as checks against any organization I'm ever involved with to make sure anything that I ever do strives really hard. But, but the point is, we're, it's not just Mormonism, and it's even not just religion. We need to be on guard in every aspect of our lives. Uh, b b pyramid yeah. schemes, you know, yep. m network marketing, every, it's Harvard. everywhere. Politics, politics, mm -hmm. right? Definitely liberal, politics. progressive, liberal politics and conservative politics. Mm -hmm. It's It can be everywhere. Government, it, yeah. that is absolutely true. And there's another important distinction to make, too, is m many of these techniques, um, if not potentially all of them, most of them, um, can be used in ethical ways. Um, and we're going to talk about some of the ethics today. A couple of these um, control techniques um, have some nuanced ethics in them and are used ethically in certain ways. And so that's another thing to keep in mind is just because you see someone, for instance, um, being loving. That's what we're going to talk about love bombing next. They might be being very friendly to you and loving and they bring you cookies. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're trying to hook you into a controlling group. It, it's the system of all the things put together and used in mm, unethical ways. Um, that's a great that, point. That's a great yeah, point. Yeah. So, um, and hopefully um, by the time you're done um, w w viewing these slides and and or reading the book um, and other materials that other authors have written, um, you will sort of create, you'll get an instinct that can help you bolster yourself against falling for any of these. Um, that said, with a little caveat, you know, sometimes I get asked, you know, Luna, how do you know you're not brainwashed right now? And my answer is I don't. In fact, when I was writing Recovering Agency, I had this little niggling thing in the back of my mind is I kept seeing these patterns of behavior in my abuser who I was living with at the time. Um, so I literally was in a controlling situation while I was writing Recovering Agency. Um, unfortunately, I couldn't really escape it at that point. And so that knowing about it or being slightly aware of it in the back of my mind wasn't really helpful. Um, uh, so that's a whole other story. Um, but yeah, that part of this, part of being on guard against this is always questioning, always being aware, n never be in an organization that's too sacred to question, never follow anyone, even in a relationship where there are um, topics that are just completely off, not maybe because you know, they're, they're upfront about it and say, look, that's a triggering topic. I really, you know, it hurts me to talk about it. We need to talk about it very carefully. Um, or we can talk about that later, but I'm talking about someone where there are topics that are completely off limits all the time. And you just, and you haven't talked about it ahead of time. You just know by their reaction that you're afraid to bring that up. That's like a red flag that, that there might be something going on. So always be ready to question and doubt any situation that you're in. That's kind of the only way to to deflect that. Yeah. yeah. And just, just for those who missed part one, go back and watch part one, but I'll just sort of say as a summary, any, any system that holds itself out as the one true system or having the totality of truth, which is sacred science, or that demands purity of its membership that has this focus on perfectionism and purity and cleanliness that, that that's that's demand for purity that that doesn't care about the individual at all and is willing to steamroll individuals for the benefit of the system that's doctrine over self that engages in black and white thinking pure good pure evil pure truth and pure falseness that that won't engage in not just gray but also multicolor shades of perspectives that's black and white thinking blame reversal where if anything if anything goes right the organization gets all the credit if anything goes wrong it's the individuals that are to blame that's blame reversal and then guilt and shame is just where where you are bad you are stained and broken using shame to control and humiliate people so that they are left in submission so that they want to follow. That's what we covered last time. It's absolutely crucial to, to listen to part one, but that's my quick summary. And now let's jump to part two. All right. Before we um, 
jump into the actual next technique, which is love bombing. There were a couple of things that I thought of after our last um, session that I wanted to just touch on. Um, uh, first of all, I want to let everyone know that being manipulated is not a moral fault. Um, it's the manipulator's fault. Uh, the manipulator is the one who makes the choice. Um, it may be subconscious, it may not, but they they are the ones acting um, to go out and find you. Um, for many of us as a baby, um, which is completely not our fault, and program you with these ideas that that changes your behavior, that controls your behavior. Um, but once we learn and discover this, we can take responsibility to free ourselves. And I also added to free others. So for many of us, for many of you, this may be a phase where you're going to be highly self-focused and that's fine. Um, it, it's totally fine to be self-focused. I mean, you were raised in a group that was completely about how you needed to sacrifice yourself for the group. So you do need a period where you are going to take care of yourself, you need to do self-care, you're going to think about what happened to you. It's a time where um, pointing the blame outward is appropriate, particularly if you're pointing that blame at the powers that be. Um, completely appropriate to do that. So, so that's good for now. And I want to stick a pin in that, though, because eventually you'll be healed and you'll be better. I mean, I don't think you'll ever be completely healed. I'm not completely healed, but you'll be more grounded and stable in yourself and more knowledgeable about who you are. And that's the time to start thinking about others. Um, there was a, a conversation I had with a Jewish person on Twitter this week about the sort of post-religious self-help movement and how there's never really any unpacking of things like white supremacy and the way that we treated marginalized people when we were in that group and how those of us who are in this field um, ought to kind of point that direction. So that's what I'm doing. Um, I'm pointing that direction is once you feel more grounded and stable and have done the work on yourself, it's time to think about other people and how your actions within the group might have impacted them. Now is not the time though, it, because if you're still dealing with guilt and shame, you don't need more of that. You need to free yourself from that. And then you can start being it from a responsible point of view um, and a well-grounded point of view where you are capable of acting, then start thinking about the people you may have hurt and how you can help them now. It's kind of like on the airplanes, you put them mask on yourself before you put the mask on somebody else. Exactly. But let's not forget to put the mask on other right. people. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then the last uh, list of point being manipulated is not a sign of low intelligence. In fact, um, the studies that have been done in that regard have shown that people with higher IQs are more likely to be recruited into a group like this and to remain in the group, um, partly because um, we're more creative when we're more intelligent um, in terms of how how do I make this these um cognitive dissonance parts that aren't fitting together, how do I make those fit together? We're, we're more creative at creating those mental gymnastics. It's not a sign of mental illness, although a group such as this can cause mental illness, um, but it doesn't mean that you are mentally ill because you decided to convert. Your, uh, it doesn't mean you lack an education. Uh, very educated people can be recruited into cults. Um, or high demand groups. It's not a sign of spiritual weakness. In fact, these groups tend to prey on people who are morally um, upright, empathetic, kind, because we're the type of people who are going to give over and dedicate our entire lives to helping others. And then they just put themselves in the place of the other, or you're help you're not helping others, you're really helping the church, but you, you feel like you're helping others. And uh, in the same line, it's not a sign of moral inferiority. So just putting that out there, um, I don't, I don't want to make people feel worse <laughs> than they have to already feel because of all of this. Yeah. No, in, in some sense it's, yeah. It, it's absolutely, mm -hmm. I, 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 you remind me of what I read in the righteous mind by Jonathan Haidt, that, that, that a high intelligence just makes you, like you said, more skilled at employing, uh, you know, kind of moral reasoning or, uh, the confirmation bias where you can justify things. And so, uh, yeah, no one should feel bad. Uh, and, and really just we're evolving as a society. So let's just keep evolving, right? Let's just keep evolving. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So let's jump beautiful. into love bombing. Yeah. Okay. So, so this is number seven. Is that right? Of the 31? Is that, that right? That is correct. Yep. That we're covering so. today. 
Yeah. And not necessarily in order in the book. I have them in a different right. order. I've presented them in different orders. Um, so uh, love bombing is sort of the hook that gets you into such a group. Now, a lot of us were born into the church. And as infants, we are 100% susceptible to love bombing. But even as adults, we are as well. Uh, love bombing is what attracts new members to the to the organization. And it appeals to your ideals and values. It says we are going to change the world. We're going to um, make casseroles for our neighbors. Um, we're going to make the world a peaceful place. We're going to bring Zion. That in other groups, that could be other ways that the group is going to change the world because they're in all these groups, they're claiming to have the perfect system and thus the perfect system will change the world. It establishes trust so that you will believe that the person who is indoctrinating you has all the truth. It creates positive mental associations with the group. So you might think those Mormons sure are nice. They wear nice clothes. They say nice things. They never swear. They're never angry. They've got a smile on their face all the time. Uh, other groups have their own positive associations that they try to project out into the world. Uh, again, not, not all of these te techniques apply evenly to every single group. So uh, some groups may not be as uh, proselytizing active. They may not be have a good a PR, a good as of a, a PR firm uh, behind them to promote those ideas. So uh, it depends on the group how positive there are some groups that, that you can just tell they're a cult just by looking at them and you wonder why anyone would ever join them. But most groups are really good at making themselves look like really good people. Um, the, and they're, the people are good in most cases, uh, but the group itself is not. Uh, they also, but th that's the thing though, is it's a false love. It's not genuine. Um, it, it might be genuine for specific individuals who are meeting with other specific individuals, but we'll get into sort of why that breaks down, even for people with the best of intentions. And that love though ends up being conditional on conformity. So if you join the church and you're new in the church and you, um, you can't quite quit smoking, you, you can't, really, you know, you leave your girlfriend or your boyfriend, but you can't really leave them for long and you're, you're back sleeping with them again or whatever. And then, then that's where the judgment comes out and the love gets withdrawn and you feel it. And then you're encouraged by that emotion to get back into good standing. I'm going to break down some of the words here because I think the words that are used within Mormonism are very telling. Um, disfellowship is literally a feeling of isolation. You're, you're being removed from your fellows. And excommunication is literally a failure to be heard. There is no two-way communication going on. It is just dictation. So. Yeah. And and we're going to talk about this in just a second, but I like to just bring it. I like to bring in, just as I'm trying to make sense of everything you're saying, bring in my Mormon experiences. Mm -hmm. We'll talk about it later. But what immediately comes to mind is so many converts to Mormonism talk about how they met people in the ward Everybody loved them, made them feel super special. Mm -hmm. The missionaries were so nice. It was like, oh, wow, I not only have these these elders or these sisters that are like now my besties, now all these members are wrapping me in love with blankets and invitations, mm -hmm. and these investigators feel like, like they're just loved by, you know, coming yeah. home to this family that's always been waiting for them, to this warm hearth of of freshly cooked bread and, and home cooked mm -hmm. casseroles. And, and then they get baptized and within, let's just say weeks to months, it's like, where'd everybody go? Right. The missionaries are transferred. The, the ward is, has moved on. And it's not saying that people weren't sincere in all that, but there is this sort of like, man, Mormons love, I don't want to say fresh meat, but they love the convert. They love the investigator but the investigators often feel, as I understand it for many, they feel initially loved. And then all of a sudden, where did it all go? Is that, yeah, is that kind and of a classic example? Exactly. Because it takes a lot of effort to do all of that. Not only yeah. that, but there, the church puts a lot of other demands on you, which we discussed in Demand for Purity. And so you've got all these other things that you have to do. And then um, you've got other converts, you know, you're supposed to save one soul and how great your joy will be with one. Well, imagine if you get even more. And so you're encouraged to go out and make new friends and convert them as well. Yeah. So it's an endless cycle. And it's interesting. If you go to the next slide, we're going to briefly talk about that, how this pattern is also discussed in survivors of malignant narcissists, 
or narcissistic right, abuse survivors. Right. Yeah. Um, and I am one of those. And so I can, I can testify, if you will, to that dynamic. When I got with my, you know, with, with the church, I wasn't a convert. So I was just born into it. And I just, it was just n- normally being a little kid, but, but I did, um, th- this guy, he came, he sweetened me off my feet wouldn't take no for an answer, but it was always the good stuff that he wouldn't take no for an answer for. It was, wasn't got, hadn't gotten to the bad stuff yet and, um, wined and dined and expensive restaurants and dancing and gifts and great words of appreciation and affection. And, you know, it, it was very easy to move in with him quickly and then really move in with him quickly. Like, I'm going to rent my house out to someone else. And then, you know, next thing I know I've lost the house and seven years go by and I've lost almost everything. Uh, be, and and that's what hurts the most is when that love is withdrawn. It's because it is so overwhelmingly, amazingly too good to be true. It's not just like falling in love. It's like falling in love times a hundred. It, it's like the Disney imagination of falling in love. It's beyond anything. And so when, when you do something that then contradicts that person or the church and you've behaved the way they don't want you to, rather than being mature and discussing it and having a two way bilateral conversation about it, he withdraws the love, but he doesn't say why, or he says why, but it's not the real reason. And so it creates that addictive it's trauma bonding is what it is. You, you are now bonded to that person. You're expecting them to behave the way they promised that they would always behave. They're telling you up front, this is just the way I am, but they're not really that way. And they, they have exhausted their resources. They have gone over and above and they, it's not sustainable, but they don't tell you up front. It's not sustainable and it's only temporary. And so you're left feeling like, what did I do? And then you're trying to keep up. Oh, I've got to behave better. I've got to do exactly what he wants to do if I want to get that back. And so it does become a sort of addictive cycle. Um, uh, the, uh, the next slide, I, th- I don't think I talk about addiction on the next slide. It's the slide after. But this, we can go on on this slide. Um, we, we, we also tend to base our trust on who we're going to believe based on likability. So if they're charming and charismatic, charismatic, we, we're going to tend to think, well, they must be right. That's just a, a wiring deep within our brain that doesn't isn't based on rationality. They, they don't have to produce any proof or evidence for anything. They are just charismatic, and so we trust them. Um, and when they give us things, whether it's a casserole or someone sweeping us off our feet, we feel that reciprocation that we talked about last time. And uh, that inspires loyalty in us. I'm going to be with this person forever or this organization forever. I'm going to um, give everything back that they that I feel like they've given to me. Our, our need for love is fundamental and universal. Um, there might be a couple of suggestion, uh, um, exceptions out there, but for the most part, everybody has a deep-seated need to be liked and loved. And um, it's, it's almost as fundamental to our um, survival as uh, eating and breathing. Um, this, this can include everything, uh, including flattery, gifts, attention, touching, compliments, invites, listening, and sharing. Listening is, can be a really big one. Sometimes all we want to do is be listened to. And the love bomber is on their best behavior. You're not seeing their dark side. They're not showing you the, the dark side. Um, again, we're talking about church members. You may not have a dark side, but the organization's dark side is sort of ends up flowing through you because you're following all of their dictates or trying to, and you just can't keep up with it. And so you do end up neglecting the new convert. And it, one important thing is it externalizes our self-esteem. So you become dependent upon the group to feel like a good person, to feel valuable. And so uh, we'll talk about dependency coming up, but that's one of the things that it creates a kind of emotional dependency. And of course, children are 100% uh, susceptible to these. Uh, the, The picture is when saw it's a Mormon ad from the eighties, everybody's dressed in their eighties clothes this is a blast right to my past. Uh, and it says, when saw the a stranger has a, a scripture reference down there. Uh, and yeah. there's a, a girl standing off alone and uh, the other girls are kind of standing together. And one's thinking about maybe talking to the, to the girl that's alone. 
Yeah, we all want to be loved. We all want to be adored. We all want to be pampered. And if if somebody if somebody treats us that way, the oxytocin, the all mm-hmm. the good chemicals go into our brain, our IQ probably drops by 10 to 20 points <laughs> and we're susceptible to all sorts of undue influence uh, because because the mirage makes us feel so dang good, right? Exactly. Yeah, it's yeah. it's a very uh, heady experience. Yeah, we all so, we all have experienced it probably most of us, yeah. Absolutely. Even just falling in love in a healthy relationship can kind of show you what it feels like. So yeah, Absolutely. So what happens is we get hooked on that love and in order to get more of that we're supposed to conform. And what happens is the group is using some different words and they're maybe behaving a little different. They dress a little different. They green jello or something, funeral potatoes. There's a little behaviors Most of them are fairly benign, but some of them may not be. And so what happens, so you don't necessarily have to have a commandment that says um, thou shalt, but we start to mimic the behavior that we see. So there's a concept in neurology called mirror neurons. And this is where when we see someone else behaving in a certain way, perhaps they're using it in monkeys there, they might be using a tool. They've done a lot of these studies on monkeys. So the monkey might be using a tool and another monkey has never used the tool before, but they're watching the monkey using the tool. And they can do brain scans and see that the the monkey who is watching the activity will have neurons firing in patterns in the brain, brain cells firing in the same pattern as the monkey who is actually using the tool. And so we're basically mirroring that behavior within our minds. We're, We're imagining what it must be like to do that thing. And that creates the same patterns in our brain. And so we see other people behaving these certain ways, and that leads us to, um, we add that to our desire to be liked. And what happens is we start mimicking that behavior, so we'll fit in. Well, cognitive dissonance, did we talk about, and we're going to talk about it this week. We did a little Um, bit, yeah. We'll talk about this more later. This will lead in um, to belief follows behavior in a bit. But when we are behaving in a way that we don't understand why we're doing it, then cognitive dissonance kicks in and says, why are you behaving that way? And the easiest way out often is to be, well, because I believe the same things they do. Mm. I don't even need a reason of why I believe the things that they do. I just, I just, I just must believe that because yeah. that's why I'm doing these things. I'm, I fit in. Therefore I am the same as these people. That's belief follows behavior. Yep. Exactly. Which yeah. We'll and we'll talk about, we'll talk bit, about that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so it it becomes addicting. I put it in quotes because some people uh, disagree with throwing that word around when it's not an actual chemical dependency. Um, But it it does sort of become a natural chemical dependency where we become willing to do increasingly extreme behaviors to maintain that feeling of love. Yeah. I'm thinking of Patty Hearst uh, in the symbiote, whatever liberation movement of the seventies, this daughter of William Randolph Hearst, super wealthy, educated, all of a sudden she's in, she be, she gets kidnapped into this group and then all of a sudden she's in love with everybody and becomes an accomplice because this stuff's super powerful, right? <laughs> right. Yeah. And they call that um, Stockholm syndrome or right. trauma bonding is the the more modern version of that word. Yeah. yeah. But it can, it can win you over. You can, like Elizabeth Smart, you can start out as a complete victim, right. but, but if, if, if they treat you the right way, you can become an accomplice. Even if they treat you the wrong way, and I don't think I really necessarily covered that concept in any of these slides, but that is true. Even if they treat you the wrong way, it's probably cognitive dissonance again. It's a survival or coping technique that thousands of years of trauma has instilled in us, probably even going back to the animal kingdom, Mm -hmm. where you admit that you're stuck. There's no way you're going to escape, and some subconscious part of your brain goes, well, may as well make something out of this may as well. And, and, and so you will, well, this person who has kidnapped me and is treating me very poorly. Um, well, at least they're feeding me, at least they're keeping me safe. Like, even if they're not feeding you regularly, you become so grateful for what they are giving you that that all just transfers. I think tr- psychological transference is, is a term uh, related with therapy. So we just sort of become one with that person. Um, it's pretty tragic. So yeah. next slide. Um, this is a quote by Michael Langoni from Recovery from Cults, which is, uh, he's the editor of that. It's a collection of essays and papers, um, which I highly recommend. He says, the apparently loving unanimity of the group masks, and in some cases bolsters, strict rules against private as well as public dis- dissent. Questions are deflected. Critical comments are met with smiling pleas of no negativity. 
Um, keep sweet. Keep sweet. Exactly. And we see that pattern. To say. Yeah, we, we see that pattern in a lot of groups. Um, just you got to stay nice. You got to keep that smile on your face. Um, always be looking, appearing to be happy, whether you are or not. That's part of part of how we became love bombers. Yeah. Uh, the next slide. So ask yourself, well, does Mormonism benefit from this particular psychological dynamic? This is from uh, a priesthood manual in 2000. And the story, I'm going to read the quote, but the story starts out as uh, uh, there's a couple and the wife is LDS and the husband is a non-member. And the church is trying to figure out how to get Jack to become a member. So they plan a barbecue. And um, the quote goes, Jack, initially reluctant to come, was surprised and delighted with the easy, natural friendliness of the group. By evening's end, he enthusiastically supported the idea of a second party, a picnic in two weeks. No one said anything about going to church, but Alan Westover, who had discussed Jack's house painting project at the party, showed up on Saturday with his own ladder and came back evenings after work. Two other men also helped several times. Later that month, when the elders quorum had a project, Jack was anxious to help them. There's that recipro reciprocity coming in. As the summer progressed, Jack spent more and more time with church members. There were chats about fishing rods and politics and raising children. To his wife's great joy, Jack told her one evening that he was ready to take the next step of being taught by the missionaries and joining the church. Mm -hmm. So mission accomplished. Yeah. And it's so complicating because, you know, you, you do want an organization, a culture that encourages service and kindness mm -hmm. and acts of charity. Like, who doesn't want that? And right. so isn't it just so complicated that and, – and I'd say many of the Mormons that engage in those acts of service are doing it mm -hmm. with sincere hearts of wanting to help people. So it's just weird how acts can be good and even people committing the acts – can be well intentioned, but all of it is working within a system of right. undue influence or coercion. It's not the charity that's the problem. It's not the service. It's not the volunteer work that's the problem. It's, um, and we're going to talk about deception today. I think deception is the key ethical um, difference there. Uh, and there are some other ethical differences too that we'll talk about. Yeah. Uh, so, so the thing about love bombing and, and just what we were just talking about, members feel sincere, but due to church pressures, they don't have time to follow up on the friendships that end in conversion and I can, that, I, that don't result in conversion. Um, and I can think of a few examples from my own life where I did neglect relationships after, you know, I started out thinking, oh, this seems like a nice friend, um, but I could probably convert them. And then when I didn't, I, I just, I had other things to do. I was too busy. So this is an area where you can let go of guilt, uh, certainly healthy to take a moral inventory and to, to think about maybe what you've done, but don't spend too much time on it. Don't beat yourself up about it. Don't use it as a tool to reduce your energies or um, hurt yourself or cause yourself new trauma. The church pressured you to act this way, and this weapon was also used against you. You were also manipulated via love bombing. There's a quote from Marion Stricker. She wrote a really good um, book online called The Pattern of Double Bind in Mormonism. I think you can also buy a, a paper copy of it. I hope it's still online. Um, and she says, whether one is born into Mormonism or not, everyone's need is for genuine human social relationships, personal, sympathetic, caring relationships to be understood, to love and be loved. Yeah. That is the core. So that's the last slide on this, this topic. Um, so if you've engaged in, in love bombing, if you've been a missionary, if you brought people into Mormonism, whatever it is, don't beat yourself up. Like my Angelo likes to say, or liked to say, when you know better, you do better. Let's not spend any time beating ourselves up. Instead of having a, 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 a sin model and a guilt mm -hmm. and a shame and a deficit model and a purity model, which means a filth model, let's have right. a learning model where we just learn and then we do better. Yeah, become a better person, and uh, you're not never going to be perfect, but you can you can over you can be a little better every day. Yeah, love it. Yeah. Okay, so we we've that's love bombing. Mm -hmm. We're on to number two for today, which is destabilization. A destabilization. This is uh this is as old as the hills. Um, all of these are. Uh, it's it basically when we talked about cognitive dissonance last time. You've got you've got these strong drivers within you to believe 
who believe what you've already believed and to be who you've already been. So if a new group wants to get in, get indoctrinate you, get in there, they've got to somehow tear down your defenses against new ideas. So destabilization is used in advertising as well. We're going to use, we're going to look at an advertising example in the next slide. Uh, very well-known marketing technique. Um, uh, your old self has to be destabilized to overcome the dissonance that you would otherwise feel to the new ideas. Um, it also suppresses the self. So we're going to see some things in common on this one with doctrine over self, um, although it's not entirely the same thing. So I did choose in my work to, to separate them because this has some different points with it. Um, when the when the group destabilizes you and causes you to start questioning things and feel a little off, they promise you relief. We are the ones that are going to fix you. And then you feel that relief and you're going to go with the, that emotional flow where it takes you. Um, it establishes trust and influence so that you, once again, have a reason to uh, listen to the leader, to uh, absorb the indoctrination that they're sending over to you. And it helps you rebuild your identity into someone new. We talked about that under doctrine over self, those pseudo personality that creates that you create that's part you and part group or part group ideal. It regresses adults to a childlike state. So children are already destabilized. Children already don't have a firm identity. They're still figuring that out depending on what age of, and what stage of development they're in. And so with children, it's really easy that this step is already done. But if you're an adult, what it does is it, it regresses you or some techniques can regress you to a childlike state where you remember what you were like as a child and are more susceptible to listening to the doctrine that the group has to give you. Um, and of course, a golden investigator is often already destabilized. They've lost a loved one. That, that is often a target um, within the, with, for missionaries. Um, you've lost a child or um, you, you've lost your job, you've gone, you're going to school for the first time, you're going off to college. These are all, um, you've moved to a new town. These are all things that make us a little wobbly inside, make us question, make us look for some answers and destabilization's already taken place and the group can come in and take advantage of that. To me, what, what immediately comes to mind is kind of the military and boot camp and how they want to break you down before they can build you back up again, that kind mm -hmm. of idea. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and I think about Christ's admonition to be like a little child, you know, I, I love the idea of an awakening or a rebirth kind of the second half of life that Richard Rohr talks about, but that can be misused to say, be submissive and innocent so that we can, we can have undue influence over you. So it's, it's tricky because these concepts can can be useful or harmful depending on it's like any tool, like a hammer. Hammer can build a house or it can be mm -hmm. used to destroy you. And and that's why tools need to be handled with care. <laughs> yes. And we will look at the ethics of this two slides from now. Yeah. Yeah. I, I do have a, a slide that addresses that. So let's look at a um, advertising example. So um, this this freeze, change, and refreeze model was originally uh, thought up by Edgar H. Schein in the book Coercive Persuasion, uh, which was written in the 60s and 70s. And um, I actually read that book after I wrote Recovering Agency and found a whole bunch of new quotes and insights into all of this. Um, but I was aware of the unfreeze, change, and refreeze process because that's talked about in the literature quite a bit. So the idea is that unfreezing throws you off balance. So the, I, the, the message is you are flawed. An example from a series of commercials that we're all pretty familiar with, are you spending too much on car insurance? So you're, what am I? I thought I was fine, but maybe I am spending too much on car insurance. Mm -hmm. So the next step is to change. And it, it basically the cause of your dissonance, your feeling dissonance, like I'm not paying too much for car insurance. That feeling is redirected to you. You're the one that's paying too much for car insurance. That's not our fault. That's your fault. And now you feel like I've, you're responsible. I'm the one that has to do the changing. And so the organization or the advertiser says, we can help. They're offering you a solution. Sticky Lizard will save you time and money. 15 minutes or less. Um, and so then comes the refreeze phase. This is where the group what promises to fix you. So all you have to do is follow the doctrines. Um, doesn't that feel better? And you feel like this sense of relief. And they can do this in a, in a 15 second commercial when they say, call now. 
they give you an action, they give you an out. You just have to pick up the phone and call and we'll solve all of your car insurance problems. So um, yeah, it we, it's used on us every day. You'll start to notice it in commercials now. Uh, when a group does it though, you know, there's again, ethics. Um, it might be one, I mean, it is sort of marginally ethical when an advertiser creates a problem and then offers to solve it within a 15 second span. Um, that's like on gray ethics, because maybe they actually are going to solve an actual problem that you may have and you just didn't realize it. But when it comes to a high demand group, the ethics, they're asking for your life. They're asking for all of your time, all of your money, all of your resources, your loyalty and obedience, your, your children, your family, they're asking for everything. And so the ethics gets real bad here um, when it comes to a group. So. Yeah, and they're offering the sacred science of a total solution that can't be questioned. That's, you know, that's when when things really become sh sketchy. Exactly. And harmful, yeah. Exactly. So speaking of ethics, uh, wait. Oh, we'll sorry, the back? ethics is the next slide. No, we're good. The, okay. I just keep promising things that I can't fulfill. <laughs> um, what do you we'll mean? Wait, what do you mean? We'll what happened? Ethics. I, said, I said it would be in two slides, and it's actually... <laughs> <laughs> Three. So oh, okay, we're good. Okay. We're fine. Okay. We're fine. So the, 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 basically what they looked at in the, um, in the communist uh, brainwashing when they were looking at the prisoners of war returning. And they also looked at people who had, who were Chinese who were sent to education camps in China. Um, and they looked at the difference between the way that the communists were educating people in China and in the prison, in the war prisons versus the way American cults were doing in the sixties. Um, there were some slight differences there and they found that one of these two patterns works better than the other in terms of creating lasting change in people. So in the communist re-education, it focused on the peripheral self, the external self, your public appearance. So it was things like your social status, your positions and roles, your political opinions, your performance, and your conformity to the social standards. In modern American religions, religious cults in particular was what they were looking at, and even political cults and other things like that. They focused on the internal self, on your central core being, on who you are as a person, which focused on family relationships, your values, your aspirations, sex and emotions, trauma, religion, and your religious convictions. And they found that focusing on the central self, which is what we, we do here with our high demand groups in our free country, is that that actually works better for creating lasting change in people. Um, I feel like I had one more thing I wanted to add on that. Uh, it, that is an interesting topic is, is we have freedom, relative freedom. We do have freedom of speech and freedom of religion. And that has sort of changed the nature of this millennials, millennia's old uh, control pattern that we've had. It's This isn't new. This isn't new. The only thing that's new is that if, if an organization comes in and kidnaps you and steals you away and puts you in a prison and then forces you to work for them uh, and believe their religion, then the FBI is going to come in and arrest them. And we actually saw that in, with the Branch Davidians. They weren't even physically forcing anyone, um, but we still had a huge debacle, which both sides were completely, it was awful. Um, uh, Branch Davidians in Waco. So, but in the past, I mean, we had Europe being dominated, say, by the Catholic Church, and they could just kidnap you and torture you if you were heretical. So the difference is, is now they have to use lures to pull you in vol voluntarily and then trap you and keep you there because unless you're locked up on a compound, which does happen, there are people who are eventually kidnapped and locked up on various compounds and the government doesn't come in and save them. But to get you into that compound, they've got to appeal to your values. And so that's part of why appealing to the central self um, convinces you more. Um, and, and they did find that torture just, it doesn't really convince you. You will comply. You will do what you were told to do. But deep down inside, you still feel like resentful and like, I'm not part of this. I'm not, I'm just doing this because I have to. So. Yeah. You want to, you want to win over their soul, right? Exactly. Exactly. You're winning over their free will. Yeah. Their free will. Yeah. And that's got to be now, given voluntarily. You know? Exactly. Yeah. So now we'll get into the ethics. We're <laughs> finally to, to one of the ethics slides. So um, 
destabilization is not always unethical. This is central to how therapy works, for instance. Um, the therapist, you know, gets you in and, and you may not trust the therapist and you might be on guard and, and you're supposed to share these deep traumas, but you don't really want to. And so that process of winning your trust and opening you up and questioning your life and um, your values and all of that is used in therapy. Um, so what's the difference? It's also used by educators who are trying to teach you something new. Uh, military training, which we've already talked about, self-help groups. Actually, there are bad self-help groups that are unethical, but there are many good self-help groups that are very ethical and that you, you accomplish the goal that you set out to do when you go there and you're free to leave when you're done. Addiction recovery is another great example of, of how this is used ethically. So, and, and all of us have undergone the same destabilization process when we went through our faith crisis and left the church. So let's look at how uh, the ethics compares. In an unethical group, deception is core to this, whereas in ethical group, it's it's mostly honest. In an unethical group, it's coercive and manipulative, whereas in an ethical group, it is you informed consent. You are consenting. You understand all of the ins and outs of what's going to happen to you. When you go to a therapist, you're paying the therapist, you know, $150 an hour to to do exactly this. You set your goals out front. Um, my goal is to overcome trauma or overcome bad habits. And you go into the therapist and the therapist agrees with you. And the therapist has the same goal that you do. Everything's up front. The amount of money you're going to pay them is up front. Um, how long you're going to be in therapy is up front and may vary over time. If you decide to leave the therapist, you're allowed to. Um, it, it's, by the way, a bad therapy and unethical therapy practice. If you say, I think I'm done with therapy and they spend anything more than a, uh, well, I'm sorry to see you go and I'm um, here if you need me again. If they try to do any manipulation to try to keep you there, guilt you, tell you you're not done yet, any of that stuff, that's an unethical therapist. And there are unethical therapists out there. Um, it, an unethical group is or process is other guided. It is guided by the person who's in charge of the group or the manipulator or the con artist. Whereas in an ethical uh, situation, it is self-guided. I want this. And the other person's like, okay, well, maybe I want something different. So let's negotiate, but you're still, it's your, your needs are still being considered. In an unethical group, it's all about the manipulator's goals. And in an ethical group, it's your own goals. In an unethical group, it's unilateral. It's top down. It's one way. And in an ethical group, it's multilateral. So everyone involved in the ethical group uh, has a say and has some share in what's happening. And an unethical group is inflexible and an ethical group is flexible and able to bend with the needs of the moment. Those are a great set of guidelines. I love it. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. So does, uh, we'll see, there's more. <laughs> we did talk about pseudo personalities a bit under doctrine over self. It uh, creates a new pseudo personality by telling you that you aren't good enough. And if you conform to the group, you might be good enough. And what happens is you internalize the group identity. So we quoted this scripture last time as well. Uh, it was the second half of the scripture we were focusing on that time. This time we're going to focus on the first half. Messiah 319, for the natural man is an enemy to God and has been from the fall of Adam and will be forever and ever, unless he yields to the enticings of the Holy Spirit and putteth off the natural man and becometh a saint through the atonement of Christ the Lord and becometh as a child, submissive, meek, humble, patient, full of love, willing to submit to all things which the Lord seeth fit to inflict upon him, even <laughs> as a child doth submit to his father. Yeah. So, so you're an enemy. You're, you're hopeless. You're helpless. There's nothing that can be done. But God, via this church, can make you okay. Just okay, though. Just, just a little bit. <laughs> yeah, but continually dependent, which we'll also talk about later. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. That's, uh, that's the way it works. And, mm -hmm. uh, and again, it's weird cause you read a scripture like that. And I remember having mm -hmm. tender feelings about scriptures like this. Um, yeah. but, but the really, the reality is it's, it's religion that, that tells you at your core. And this is, a, a, unfortunately atonement theology, you're broken, your core, you're inadequate, you're a sinner, um, and, and who you are at your core is, is a problem. And now you need Christ, which really means the church and your bishop and the leadership structure right. and the corporation to make you whole. 
Yep. Right. And it's never just Christ on your own terms. If, if the spirit tells you that your relationship with Jesus ought to be something different than what the church has told you, then you'll come into conflict with the church and, and you won't be around for very long, especially if you talk about it, they're going to kick you right out. So. Absolutely. And, and it's never really about doing the introspection. It's never on the table. Introspection of what makes me tick? What do I really want? Am I a male? Am I a female? Who am I attracted to? What am I attracted to? Uh, what makes me tick? What career do I really want? Do I want kids? Like none of that's on the table. It's just like, get on the train. Here's, here's your assigned roles. Get on the train. And uh, one size fits all theology. Personal introspection is just not even part of the plan. <laughs> yeah, totally yeah. out. So does the church encourage these? Uh, well, we have a, a couple quotes here. Um, this is from Neil A. Maxwell from a conference in 1990. He says, selfishness is often expressed in stubbornness of mind. Having a, hard, a mind hardened in pride often afflicts the brightest who could also be the best, but implied you're not the best unless dot, dot, dot. One thing the brightest often lack, meekness. Instead of having a willing mind which seeks to emulate the mind of Christ, a mind hardened in pride is impervious to counsel and often seeks ascendancy. Jesus, who was and is more intelligent than they all, is also meek than they all. Interestingly, I've been thinking about the word meek lately, and I looked it up in the dictionary. We'll talk about loaded language in a different um, on a different day, but um, the, the a group, high demand groups do sort of change the meaning of words or at least sort of create their own words or their own definitions of words. And meek, I always thought sort of meant submissive, but it actually just means gentle. Those are two different concepts completely. Mm, yeah. And yes, yeah, so I, I recommend, highly recommend a lot of these churchy words, go look them up in a dictionary and think about what they mean. Think about not just a dictionary, but also look at them in other contexts and how other people use them. Because words have a lot of different meanings and a lot of different nuances, and it expands our ability to think when we can think differently about all the words. Sometimes uh, we, we ruin words. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and on purpose, again, for a topic for another time. So he continues in this talk, Neil A. Maxwell, one of the last subtle strongholds of selfishness is the natural feeling that we own ourselves. Those mm. who have chosen to come into Christ soon realize that they do not own themselves. Instead, they belong to him. Mm. Clinging to the old self is not a mark of independence, but of indulgence. Indeed, the gospel brings glorious illumination as, our pos as to our possibilities. Scales fall from our eyes with the shedding of selfishness. Then we see our luminous and true identity. This so, is so, this is, I'm yeah. sorry, this is just so, uh, because I loved Neil A. Maxwell. He's one of my favorite apostles. Mm -hmm. I, I'm old enough to remember when he was in his glory days of, of using literal literary eloquence and mm -hmm. fancy words and alliteration in general conference. And every time he got up for a talk, it was just this powerful, eloquent, well-written, well-spoken, well-delivered thing. And so mm -hmm. it's really... It's, it's kind of, I don't want to say triggering, but it brings back a lot of uh, strong emotions because here he is basically saying, give yourself to Christ. You don't even own yourself. Exactly. Christ owns you. And if you give yourself to Christ, um, and, and, and there's, there's a sweetness on the surface to that because it's, you know, you think of Christ, you think of someone who's loving and kind and serves you and will give everything for you. But when, when the Mormon church says Christ, what they mean is the organization, your bishop, the leadership structure, the general authorities, the commandments, the rules. And it really is this corporation that is Christ's surrogate on the earth. And so something that has the wrappings of sweetness has this, this, this corporate machinery in the background that is really what you're tying yourself to. And I, I don't mean to be so harsh and stern about it, but that's how I I'm, have that reaction too. It's visceral. It's, it's visceral. and I don't think, I don't think it's inappropriate to use the word trigger here. And as an abuse survivor with PTSD, it is not inappropriate to 
use the word trigger in these concepts. Um, in fact, we probably should have put a trigger warning on this whole thing. T thinking about this stuff and talking about this stuff is going to bring up reactions because you're looking at it in a new way that you never have before and realizing that you were hurt in ways that you haven't realized before. And so, yeah, it's, it's a visceral reaction and it, it may be bringing up trauma and it may be pushing those buttons. Um, and so you sure it may not be bringing on a panic attack, although that could happen. Um, it's still, I think trigger is, is still appropriate for that. Yeah. Ah, Okay. Yeah. Neil. Yep. So that leads us into deception. Do we have anything else we want to say on destabilization? No, that's, that's uh, such an important term. Uh, it's basically, you know, being born again, but, but hijacking you into living someone else's life. You're basically giving, you know, the, this is just this idea of informed consent was, was one of the things that jumped out at me most mm -hmm. because really what is life? Life is the time you have. It's your money. It's your time. It's your identity. Mm -hmm. And you should know exactly what you're giving your life to. And, uh, whatever you, if, if you give your life to something that isn't you, it better dang well be what it claims. Um, but should any should any organization be asking for your life for your identity right. um or or should that be yours and exactly. and so um it's just such a this this idea of destabilization without informed consent giving your life over to an organization that at the end of the day is going to choose the organization over in an individual every single time an example of this was just recently with Fiona Givens like uh, you know, I've been hard on apologists because what they do is they carry water for the church mm -hmm. and, and they're good people. They're smart people, but we know at the end of the day, when it's the individual versus the church, the individual will be crushed every single time. Mm -hmm. And we have one of Mormonism's most beloved apologists, Fiona Givens working in the Maxwell Institute with her husband, Terrell, giving their whole identity, their time, their energy, their effort to the church. She starts talking about her own views on mother in heaven. And before long, she's ground and removed from the Maxwell Institute and silenced and told she's not able to go on her retreats anymore. Time and time again, you think that you're loved. You think that you've been love bombed. You think that um, this organization is going to care for you like gentle, loving parents. Mm -hmm. But if you cross them, you will be removed and ground into irrelevance and forgotten. And I hate to speak of it in such stark terms, but that's what happens when you give your identity over to an organization uh, and, and, and you should I mean, never what, do it. What more stark terms than Neil A. Maxwell is the subtle stronghold of selfishness is the natural feeling that we own ourselves. I mean, he says it right there. He's saying you don't own yourself. I mean, that's, he says it more starkly than either you or I, uh, you know, those who have chosen to come into Christ soon realize that they do not own themselves, but, but you do, you do own yourself. You, you get to make your, if you had free agency, which you do, you get to own yourself. You get to make your choices. You get to fight back against people who are trying to tell you that you can't make your own choices and trying to force you into not making your own choices. You get to do that. So absolutely. I give absolutely. you permission. <laughs> So All deception. right, so on to deception, which, uh, well, I'm just going to say Mormonism gets an A-plus in, in destabilization. Not that they're the worst organization out there. I'm sure there are others that that are much more abusive, uh, that, are, that are much more stark, but, but Mormonism absolutely does uh, try and take away your identity and, and rebuild you. So love bombing and deception so far really are A-pluses. Um, Love bombing and destabilization. Let's see how yeah. Mormonism does with deception. All right. So deception. So this kind of is the ethics talk. Deception is the biggest thing that separates a cult from an ethical group. Um, an ethical group can do a lot of these techniques, maybe not all of them, but a lot of them and still pass because they're if they're upfront and telling you the truth, then you are able to consent in an informed way. Um, I think the military is a great example of that. I don't necessarily agree with the military's techniques uh, and I don't necessarily agree. I do agree we need a military, but I don't necessarily agree with 
I don't like it. I don't like that we need a military. And so, but, the, but in order to create people who can pull a trigger without even wincing, that is a necessary thing to have a military. They have to break people down and uh, build them back up. And there, and some may argue there are some levels of deception within the military, um, but it is more ethical in the sense that when you go down to the recruitment office, you pretty much know you're going to go to a boot camp and it's going to be hell and you're going to get yelled at by a sergeant who's going to call you a lot of names. And they're going to break you down and they're going to build you back up into someone who can pull a trigger without flinching. And, and you know that, and you, you know, you're going to get paid for a certain amount of time that you're just going to be an out after the time that you committed to serve and may, and there are going to be some options for you to move on and become career military. All of that is up front again, with some nuances, I've heard some stories about where they kind of been, been that a little bit from, from time to time for, for people, um, but overall, the military is far more upfront about what you're going to go through and what's going to happen to you than than these high demand groups that we're talking about. Absolutely. If the group made all these promises and they actually came true and they were working on your behalf, there's absolutely nothing wrong with it. If there really was an eternal life and if you prayed every time you prayed, you got an answer. And every time you followed the commandments, you had the Holy Spirit. And if every single promise that the church made actually consistently came true then so be it. They're telling the truth and that's just the way it is and go for it. Um, but the group has to self-aggrandize and the leaders are actually serving themselves. Every member is a pawn to be drained dry. They are just using the members to get money, to get power, to get fame, uh, to promote themselves and get more members. You're just a, a, an object. You're, you've been objectified by the group. Um, particularly by the leaders. And of course, the only way that you would ever agree to a situation where you would be a pawn to be drained dry is mm -hmm. if they lie to you about it. Yeah. So Absol yeah, that's, absolutely. that's what, that's the big separation between a, a cult and a, um, uh, an ethical organization that's doing some kind of change on you, like an, like an education system or something. I love that. So, so what happens is the, the leaders make promises that they can't keep and that causes some negative effects on people, which people might want to complain about. So then they instill techniques to hide those negative effects. They hide the fact that their promises are broken. Then they might, that might attract predators because now predators know they can do whatever they want to in that system without getting caught. And so you end up with unethical and criminal behaviors going on with in the organization, either by the leaders or by members that are, that are being covered up. And so they hide all those unethical and harmful behaviors. Um, they hide the abuses that occur. And then they hide challenging doctrines that come up, um, the, 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 the meat that you're supposed to have milk before. So if you're not ready for that doctrine and you learn about it and then they try to hide that. So you, you won't, uh, you won't, uh, I just lost all my words. You won't, you won't be, um, challenged by them and leave the church. And those doc challenging doctrines are actually about creating tighter control. And so they don't want people to catch on to that before it's, before they're ready for it. They hide negative history and testimonies and bad word of mouth. Other groups do this too. Other high demand groups do all of these things. They obfuscate their control methods. So they don't just say, well, we're doing this destabilization so we can get at you and control you. They make other promises. We're doing this to make you a better person or to bring you into Christ. So Maxwell used the word luminous. We're trying to make your, your life full of light. Um, and, it, and it makes the followers feel like they have choices when they don't necessarily have choices. Um, informed consent is really important. You cannot make a choice, a true choice, if you don't know what choice you're making. If you don't know um, that you're, you're choosing something that's going to make you unhappy, if you knew that, you wouldn't choose it. Uh, if you knew you didn't have a choice, you probably wouldn't choose to even go there. Yeah, and it, this is so hard because um, it it is a high standard of ethics to expect an organization from the outset to be fully honest. And so, if I'm looking at these, if I'm looking at like what would the most honest Mormon missionaries be, right? They <laughs> they would show up at your door and they would sure they'd give you their beliefs and they would give you the plan of salvation. Um, and they would tell you all the reasons why there are positive things about being Mormon, but they would also say, okay, you know that priesthood blessings that we talk about and the priesthood power? Well, a lot of times those blessings really don't heal. Mm -hmm. And 
you know, and you know about we talk about the ward and, and all this love bombing you're getting. Well, sometimes the wards forget about you and they hurt you and there's backbiting and people are mean. And sometimes that lovely bishop, well, sometimes bishops are abusive and they even abuse people sometimes. And, um, you know, there's and, no complaint hotline when they do. There's no, no one you can call to to fix that problem. Yeah, and, and, and sometimes, here's a list of commandments that you're going to have to keep that has dozens and dozens of commandments on it. I'll show you all up front. You have to we'll commit to these. You. Otherwise, none of it will work. None of it will work unless you follow every single one of these perfectly. <laughs> and yeah. by the way, if you're a person of color, you may want to know that back in before 78, we, you know, and, and of course we don't do that. And, and if you happen to be gay or you know, transgender or whatever, like, here's what is in store for you. And, and okay, now let's really get into what Joseph Smith actually did and who he married and, and how he died, like all of that. And the temple ceremony, what's really going to happen when you go to the temple, like, uh, you know, all the different ways they just, there's no informed consent. Uh, they, the church kind of hides under milk before meat. Um, and, uh, all that means is that you're, you're not going to handle it until you get all these mind control things installed on in you. It, the meat is okay. Now you're in, you're dependent, you're hooked. There's no going anywhere now for you. You're stuck. Now you get to have the really challenging stuff because your cognitive dissonance is definitely going to resolve in favor of the church when you're, when you're in too deep. Yeah. yeah. It's like the, it's like the, um, the, the, at the car dealership if the longer they can keep you there, the long, the more likely it is that you're going to buy a car. Um, sunk, the sunk cost fallacy, right? It, right. They're able to realize the more they get you in, and we're going to talk about public testimonies in this episode, actually, mm -hmm. the more they can get you committed to it, the less likely it is you're going to be able to pull those hooks out basically. Right. Yeah. Right. But they do it like you it, just, the point you made is brilliant. You, no one would ever sign up for any of this without <laughs> deception. They have got to hide as much as possible from you of the dark stuff, of the bad stuff, of the high commitments, or no one in their right mind would ever join. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So we do have a slide. Oh, back one more. Oh, sorry. The this, uh, Yeah. There's yes. a picture of dirt, a uh, bowl of dirt. Um, so here's a little bit more about uninformed consent is it's a can of a can with a soup label, but there's dirt inside. Members are not, we just talked about this. Members are not told up front how much will be required. The commandments aren't listed in all one place. Children cannot consent to an eternal commitment. I want to make this really clear. A child cannot sign a contract until they're 18. A child can't get a credit card. They can't vote. They can't consent to sex. They can't consent to get married. There are a lot of adult things that children cannot consent to, but for some reason, the church thinks it's okay to Get children to commit eternally, forever and ever and ever and ever, at the age of eight. But they're old enough at that point to do that. And that's that's not okay. Yeah. So, yeah. and then finally, there's no safe opt out, safe opt out in Mormonism. There is no way to say, hey, I'm done with this without some really harsh consequences. You might lose your family, you might lose your social support, you're gonna lose your eternal blessings, you're gonna, you're gonna burn in burning the celestial kingdom forever. There's some double speak there. I always get, I always like, Burr. but you're going to burn in Mormon hell forever. And uh, there, there's just no way to walk away from it. In an ethical group, there is always an out. There's always a, there's an end. If it's a contract that you signed for an employment thing, there is an end date. Most jobs you can quit at will in most States. Um, you, you might even, even Comcast, you sign up for a year, get your cell phone or your cable network or whatever like that. Even in that, the most hated corporation in America and the most, con you know, you get your new iPhone and you, you're going to Verizon or whoever it is. I want to whatever cell phone company you do and you get stuck in a two year contract. Even then there is an out. You might have to pay $500 to compensate for the fact that you now have an iPhone for free, but you still have a, a there's an exit strategy. There is a way out for you. Um, there is no way out for Mormonism, no legitimate way out. Yeah, and someone will say, "Well, you can always leave. You can always resign, right?" But, but I think the point is, uh, a high demand religion or a cult is defined by how it treats you when you leave. And there's no gracious or dignified or honorable way to leave Mormonism. You are cut off. You are viewed as an apostate. You are viewed as weak. You are viewed as fallen. 
Um, so yes, you can leave. Yes, you can resign, but not with your dignity. No, <laughs> not and it's with not any, emotionally no. safe. It's often not physically safe um, if you're dependent on the church, which we'll talk about in a minute. And and there's no, you know, I mean, we get frustrated with trying to find how to cancel a subscription on a lot of these company websites, but eventually somewhere in the fine print, somewhere down the phone menu, there is a way to cancel your subscription. I challenge you to find the cancel my subscription button on the church website. The, I want to resign from the church now, where's the form? There is no form. You got to go to yeah. third parties to learn the le the legal way to get out of the church with the least legal consequences. Absolutely. And but that, by the way, that was a right that was won. So I think it was in the eighties, up until the eighties, you actually could not leave the church without being excommunicated. They could kick you out, but you couldn't go to the church and say, I resign. And there was a, it was a different church. There was a Supreme court pre precedence. It was a different church. I think it was in Arizona, some other religion. And uh, the person tried to quit their church and they couldn't quit their church. And so they sued and went all the way to the Supreme court and they won us the right to leave the church. But if you were trying to leave the church in the seventies, Good luck. You can't. So, yeah, Absolutely. you got to go out and sin and then they got to kick you out. <laughs> that's, yeah. that's that was the way out then. So right. does the church practice deception? Well, this is a very famous, uh, at least among ex-Mormons, quote by Boyd K. Packard, not a very famous quote amongst uh, true believing Mormons. So it's one of the things that they're covering up. This was a talk given to uh, given at Brigham Young University in 1981. He said, teaching some things that are true prematurely or at the wrong time can invite sorrow and heartbreak instead of the joy intended to accompany learning. The scriptures teach emphatically that we must give milk before meat. The Lord made it very clear that some things are to be taught selectively and some things are to be given only to those who are worthy. It matters very much not what we are told, but what we are to but when we are told it. Be careful that you build faith rather than destroy it. I think he gave that to CES members, so uh, mm -hmm. seminary teachers, BYU teachers, institute teachers. Um, so Boy K. Packard. And, and there's also that famous quote, not all things that are true are useful, mm -hmm. right? I think I, I have that quote in my book as well. So that's yeah. them just straight up admitting that they that they do use deception. You're not going to find them admitting that very often. That's why I had to go all the way back to 1981 to find that because that is part of the deception. If they came out and said, oh, by the way, we're dishonest about a bunch of stuff, you might want to look into that, check some third-party reviews before you join us, then they wouldn't be deceptive. So... Um, yeah, and and just for, the, for those who are joining Mormon Stories, kind of newer to Mormon Stories, I just want to say... We've done some real uh, important coverage over the past year or two of how much the church is known and for how long it's known it. And whether it's the the Book of Abraham, you know, the the problems with the translation of the Book of Abraham was, was on a cover of the New York Times in 1912. The church has known about the problems of the Book of Abraham for well over 100 years. Whether it's the B.H. Roberts scandals of the 19 teens and 20s where B.H. Roberts basically came to understand the Book of Mormon to not be a historical document. All the anachronisms, the view of the Hebrews stuff. Uh, there was a meeting in 1922 with Shannon Caldwell Montes. She's the scholar that helped remind us about the great Mormon meetings where all the First Presidency Quorum of the Twelve, all the general authorities sat in a room for three or four days in Salt Lake City and were debriefed about all the ways the Book of Mormon was not a historical document whether it's Fawn Brody and excommunicating her for No Man Knows My History, uh, a book that came out in 1945, which told a truthful history of Joseph Smith, whether it's the Leonard Arrington years of church history from 72 to, to 82, where the church historians started uncovering the factual history again and talking about it, and all the brethren, including Packer, shut it down because we can't have you know anything discussed that could cause members to question and of course the excommunication of the September 6 and me and Bill Real and Sam Young and like it, there is zero question that the church has well over a decade a, a century of systematically hiding uh the truth about its history knowingly hiding the truth about its history and punishing anyone who talks about it right that that all the way that, back to Joseph Smith that, he is an obvious 
I mean, William Law's publishing uh, an, an expose on polygamy and one issue. Next thing you know, a mob is burning down, ordered by the mayor, which is a theocracy. You're having a literal United States mayor um, suppressing freedom of speech. That I mean, he, he wasn't just some person like a church leader. He, he was actually like in a government position when he did that. So yeah, it goes all the way back. The and the church has hid Joseph Smith's treasure digging with the peepstone mm -hmm. and his folk magic. His polygamy was unbeknownst to the members forever. Mm -hmm. Like the, the connections to the temple ceremony and the Masonic Lodge, like just take your pick. It, it has been yeah. 200 years of knowing intentional deception. Now that doesn't mean that the brethren aren't smart enough to employ the tools of confirmation bias to actually believe it all. I, I'm, I'm not necessarily in that camp that thinks they're all knowing frauds, mm -hmm. but they are knowing deceivers. And they, there's this concept of lying for the Lord, which you can see also in past Mormon stories episodes, we've covered that where, where because of teachings in the Bible, because of Joseph Smith's teachings, it, it is a, it is an intentional technique and an intentional code of morality or ethics that you can knowingly and intentionally deceive as a leader in the Mormon church, if you're doing it to preserve precious testimonies, which infantilizes the members that they're so innocent and feeble and their testimonies mm -hmm. are so fragile That's that we have to protect them by knowingly deceiving them and lying to them. That's the history of Mormonism for over 200 years. Yeah, Am I overstating it, 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 Luna? Am I overstating not, it? You're not overstating it. And you know, far you're able just to rattle all that stuff off much better than I am. And and the thing is, is if you know, in in the world of free thinking and critical thinking, the the concept is is if your idea it can hold up to scrutiny, then it's a good idea. And if it can't hold up to scrutiny, then it's a bad idea. And that's what the principle in play here. The the Mormon idea there is flawed. And it cannot stand up to scrutiny. And so they have to hide those flaws as their only strategy for the whole thing to not just completely fall apart. Yeah. So Mormonism gets an A++++ in deception. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, it doesn't make me happy to give that grade, but it is a master of deception. I want the Mormon church to be healthy and to be upfront about all this. They lose a lot of members and a lot of tithes, but... Um, in terms of the the human cost, uh, I I would take that trade as who I am. Save save all those people from all that spiritual abuse and trauma. Yeah, and and again, I'll just I'll just say this really quickly. A lot of people say, "Well, John, you're trying to destroy the church," or "John, you you hate the church." No, 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 no. It's it's really as simple as this. When people are giving their life, their identity, their time, their money, ten percent of their income, their children. When they're giving all of that to an organization, that's a lot to give to an organization. Mm -hmm. People deserve to know what they're giving their lives, their time, their money, and their children to. And right. so people deserve informed consent. So I don't want to take everyone out of the church. I don't want to destroy the church. I want everyone who has ever been, who is now, or who will ever be a member of this church to simply know everything about what they're joining before they make those commitments so they can make an informed, intelligent decision. And then from there, if they still want to be a part of it, they have my full exactly. support as autonomous humans of with free will. They have my blessing, but only yeah. if, and only then, um, and I won't, and I won't rest until everybody can engage Mormonism with informed consent. <laughs> yes, exactly. I'm, I'm with you there. All right. So deception, yeah. uh, we've done now it's belief follows behavior. All right. So, uh, we talked about why we might do things we don't understand under love bombing. Um, but when we do a thing that we don't understand cognitive dissonance is, is like subconsciously going, what, what are you acting weird for? It makes us automatically believe the offered explanations. So the church says you're doing it because the church is true and because Jesus loves you and because the Book of Mormon is true and because the church was restored by Joseph Smith, the prophet. And, and that's your explanation. So your brain goes, why am I doing this? Because it's true. The picture, by the way, is a picture of Joseph Smith with some hipster glasses on. And it says Mormons calling each other bro before it was cool. 
Mm. Um, what, what is it? What do you mean by that? Why'd you pick that? Meme. Oh, because it's funny. It's a joke. I have a few <laughs> jokes in here because uh, we brother and sister and um, it's a hipster joke and a Mormon joke. Anyway, um, so all of these processes are subconscious usually. Uh, and in order for this belief follows behavior mechanism to work, the behavior has to feel voluntary. If you feel like you're doing something because someone is forcing you to, then your cognitive dissonance will resolve to, I'm doing this because I'm being forced to. So if we show up at, at the Mormon dance or whatever, we've been invited by a friend and we're standing around and everybody's got that accent and they're talking about the Book of Mormon and about volleyball on Saturdays and, um, and, and, I don't, I've been out of the church so long. I don't remember how Mormons <laughs> behave, but they're doing the, the little things and um, they have their little sayings that they say. And, and you start to just kind of, they're calling each other brother and sister. I think that might be why I have that slide there. Actually. Thank you for asking me these questions, John. Um, you're keeping me, uh, keeping me smart, I guess. <laughs> so, so we we're calling each other brother and sister and you, you, get, you join the church and you're like, I'm calling every brother and sister. I don't really understand why they say it's because maybe we were brothers and sister in the preexistence. I don't really know if I accept that, but you're doing it now. And so, um, so you start feeling like maybe because it's true. Um, these aren't commanded. No, no prophet. I don't think has ever said thou shalt call each other brother and sister. Or, thou shalt have funeral potatoes or any of the other wear a dress. Um, sometimes that's commanded, but usually we we see that other people are wearing nice their Sunday best. And so we put on our Sunday best so that we don't feel like we stand out. Um, so we don't have that shame, which we talked about as well. So the more unusual the behavior, the more likely it is to resolve to belief. So we might ask ourselves, why don't Mormons become even more mainstream than they are? Why don't we wear... Why don't they allow women to wear slacks to church and men to wear whatever sweatshirt or whatever that they want to feel most comfortable in? Well, part of that is that because it's a little bit unusual, that makes us, you know, if you wore a sweatshirt to church, you wouldn't be like, why am I wearing a sweatshirt to church? It must be because the church is true. But if you're wearing something you're not used to wearing and it's kind of uncomfortable and it's, you know, then you might be like, okay, it must be because the church is true. Um, but there's a balance there because if the behavior is too weird, like there's a movie, dude, where's my car where the cult in that movie, they wear bubble wrap all the time. And, um, I'm sure that there are definitely some cults that do things that are too weird, but if it's too weird, then they're not going to get as many recruits because you're going to do, so it has to be just weird enough, you know, um, preferably something that makes you kind of look nicer stand out a little bit better, um, look upper class. So that's, that's one part of the Mormon's dress code. Um, and the odd behavior though, if it's just slightly odd, does reinforce isolation, which is Malou control, which we'll talk about later is if you're just slightly odd enough, it'd be like people outside the church might be like, yeah, those are those Mormons. I don't know. They're kind of weird. And when you do talk to them, the conversation might be a little awkward because they're from different subcultures. And that actually helps reinforce the fact feeling that you're different from other people and that you're not the same, that you're a peculiar people. Um, and we'll also talk about us versus them, which, which is in another presentation. Um, so, and so, hmm? yeah, no, 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 uh, finish the slide. And then I was okay. just going to jump in. Yeah. Last point is that all of these little signs, you know, do you smell like cigarette smoke? Or are you drinking a Pepsi? All of these subtle little signs play into demand for purity. It gives us a way that we can quickly judge their outward signs. They're not internal signs. Like, are you honest? The church could spend a lot more time talking about honesty, which I feel is very good value. It's my most important value. Um, they could, they could spend more time on helping people become more charitable, but, th but they spend more time on the little things like sexual purity and caffeine, word of wisdom kind of stuff because they're outward, because we can see it's hard to tell if someone's being dishonest unless mm. they're just outright lying about something that's obvious, mm. but drinking a Pepsi, you can see that and you can judge it. It makes you feel like a better person. I don't drink Pepsi, but they, they're a bad person. So I'm better than them. And it, it, creates, it helps that feeling like I'm, I'm right. I'm righteous. And you get this, the, you get this sort of uh, culture where people have got the perfect hair and the perfect clothes <laughs> And maybe they're a sexual abuser behind the scenes. Like it's this weird dissonance where you, you got the public face and then the private behavior. But as long as you create the appearance of, of uh, fitting the mold and living the lifestyle, um, everyone's good. And mm -hmm. then you just don't talk about the problems. 
And that's the way the system kind of can roll forward and self-perpetuate. Based on appearances, yeah. I'm going to take this just slightly in a, I, 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 I'm very confident you're going to feel like this harmonizes with what you're going to say, but it's a slightly different uh, look or lens on this idea of belief follows behavior. Mm -hmm. I do think you're going to, um, you're going to address this in a second, but I was just thinking about the fact, this is just a little bit personal. You talked about honesty being your most important value. I, I, I had that growing up as well. I think my parents will say they cannot remember a time where I ever lied to them ever, like through, mm -hmm. through college. Um, and, uh, and, and part of that was because I saw in my family life, what happens when you're dishonest. And I saw people's lives blow up when they were living secrets that were harmful. So honesty was always like number one for me. And so I was always taught in seminary. Oh, well, you know, the church is true and you can know it for yourself. And if you pray, you'll get the answer. So I read the book of Mormon and I pray and I read it and pray, I read the whole thing, live the standards, you know, and I pray and I, I'm not going to just like lie. I'm like, I want that answer. And I pray and I didn't get the answer. But what we all know happens in Mormonism is this teaching of you gain a testimony. How? by bearing it. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and we're going to talk about testimonies later in this very segment, but it's also this idea of live it, plant the seed and live it. And then the mm -hmm. fruits will come forward and then you'll know it's true. Um, that's kind of the Alma 32 plant the seed kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And all I'm going to say there is for me, the best metaphor of what you're talking about is one of the biggest strokes of genius on the part of the Mormon church, which is having a missionary program because how many I've, I've done 1500 hours of, of people's stories within Mormonism. It's almost a cliche. You get to 19, you're not totally sure if the church is true, but you've been living it all these years. Then you go on a mission and you get to this point where you have to start telling other, you have to, you, you clean up your hair, you wear the white suits, you wear the ties, or if you're a woman, if you present as a woman, you wear the dress, you look all Mormony, and you start bearing your testimony, living it in a mo. And I think some would say the most cool -like thing about Mormonism is the mission experience where you're cut out, literally cut off from your family living it 24 by seven and, and you bear your testimony even when you don't have it. And I remember that first moment where I had to go bear, teach a lesson to my first investigator in my mind, I'm thinking, do I really know this is true? And I'm like, I don't, I never got that answer, but then I make this decision. I'll just bear my testimony. It'll be an act of faith. And if, and maybe I'll come to know it by burying it. And that's what we're literally taught. A testimony is obtained by burying it. And that right. for me, the missionary program is a metaphor and that belief following behavior. I just can't think of a better metaphor than the Mormon mission. Now, I, I don't know that that's exactly where you were going, but please tell me Luna that this aligns uh, with, with kind of the direction and the theme. It does. It does. And we'll get more into specifically about testimonies under public commitment, which is a right. type of belief follows behavior. Uh, yeah. But for now, a belief follows behavior is like a broader umbrella. So that includes any kind of behavior. And a mission is an excellent example. That's a huge step. You're giving up your schooling and maybe a relationship. And I mean, you're paying money, to go. <laughs> paying for it. Um, it's You're paying to volunteer for to be a salesperson for uh, uh, sometimes, and I study this stuff. Sometimes I don't even understand how they get it to work, but they do. Isn't that brilliant? You pay to be their salesperson. Yeah. It's ridiculous. <laughs> it's yeah. so, but by doing that, a lot of people get a testimony and this is the mechanism through which that happens. Why did I give up two years of my life? Why did I go to all this trouble? Why am I paying all this money? must be because it's true. And you're sub again, it's subconscious. You don't sit down with a journal and a piece of paper and just pros and cons. It's not like that. It's not conscious. It's not informed consent. It is subconscious. It's a reaction and it doesn't always work. It doesn't work for everyone. Um, didn't really work for me. I mean, I didn't go on a mission, but I, I did all the other steps and, um, I never really had a testimony. I had some spiritual experiences, but it was still hard for me to say, I know this church is true when, when I didn't even, but I did it anyway. Um, 
because the pressures, I mean, I was three and they stuck a microphone in my face and I was supposed to say the things. So. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So next slide. So uh, this can be the different behaviors can be, uh, here's a list of some of those um, can be clothing and hairstyles, which we've discussed your diet, uh, which is the word of wisdom in the Mormon, in case of Mormonism. Uh, and also just particular dishes that are that the Mormon culture uh, is used to having. Um, it can be rituals, either large ones or small ones, like it could be praying every morning on up to the sacrament or the temple ceremony. Hymns, music, church yep. attendance, temple attendance, right? Yep, yep. And music is the next one, singing songs and or chanting in some groups. Uh, it, personal expression, writing, art, public speaking. Uh, games and shared activities, manners of speaking. So the just particular ways of using words or swear methods. vernacular. Definitely yeah. that. Yep. And volunteer work. And interestingly with volunteer work, the more menial it is, the better. If you're feeling like you're gaining a skill while you're doing the work, then you aren't going to, it's not going to work as well. And you see this in Scientology a lot where they put they, they put the, their best accountant or lawyer to work as punishment cleaning toilets. And by the way, pounding, I've been really pounding careful. rocks, pounding rocks, pounding digging, rock. yeah. digging ditches that you fill in, you know? Yeah. And you think to yourself, why am I doing this? Now I do want to add, I, I don't want to denigrate um, what they call unskilled labor because it is skilled. Um, of course. Cleaning yeah. toilets is valuable. It's a great service. So, but it, it's not about what the actual objective of, of the, of the task is it's about what we feel it is. So we feel like this is unskilled labor. We feel like it's menial. We feel like we're above this and we're doing it anyway. And so that we feel and that judgment, ju judgment of other types of work also helps us, um, helps the church create that, that feeling in us of hierarchy. So we feel like we're higher on a rung than someone who cleans toilets. And I, I do want to put a shout out there to everyone who cleans right. toilets. It is this skilled work and it is valuable. Um, I personally don't feel like it's lesser work, but people who do, um, when they're doing it, they're in service to a group like this, they're going to feel like, why am I doing this? Maybe because it's true. And mostly if the work, if the mini, if the if the work is assigned as a way to subjugate, humiliate, and control the individual mm -hmm. who is doing the work, and honestly, I think missions are can be that. This tracting, this brainless, mindless, knocking on doors, getting rejected day after day after day. You, you would think that would make you hate the organization giving you the work and the assignment. But what it does is it makes you more loyal. It's like, man, I gave two years of my life and those are the best two years of my life paying to get door slammed in my face day after day after day. Cause there's some bonding that happens when you've served something and even paid to serve something and given such a sacrifice, you would think it would be the opposite, but psychologically you become bonded to something that you serve so uh, committedly for so long. Exactly. That's exactly the dynamic that happens there. Yeah. So on the next slide, we'll kind of talk about um, how this worked in the prisoners of war in Korea in the fifties. And um, here's a quote from, there's a picture here of, uh, American prisoners of war captured by Korean forces uh, that are awaiting liberation in 1950, black and white photo. And so this quote is by Robert Chan Cialdini from Influence, his book Influence. It said, the Chinese set about arranging the prison camp experience so that their captives would consistently act in desired ways. Before long, the Chinese knew these actions would begin to take their toll, causing the prisoners to change their views of themselves to align with what they had done. Writing was one sort of commitment, committing action that the Chinese urged incessantly upon the captives. It was never enough for the prisoners to listen quietly or even agree verbally with the Chinese line. They were always pushed to write it down as well. And in my reading about this situation, what they would do is they would offer a small incentive. And the smaller the incentive, the better this technique works. Um, and again, it has to feel free. It has to feel like you're choosing it. That's why you offer the incentive. You don't say, you better write this essay on the benefits of communism or we're going to put you in the 
the hot box again, that doesn't work because you're going to think, well, I'm going to write it, but I'm not going to believe it. What they do is they'd offer you some tiny little creature comfort. They'd offer you a toothbrush. If you write an essay, a one page essay on the benefits of communism, we're going to give you a toothbrush. And it worked way better. The prisoners of war, they came back who had been through that sort of program were more likely to stick to their beliefs that communism was the way to go um, than those who had been forced or had been offered larger incentives. Like we're going to give you a couple of days of freedom or or whatever the larger incentive might have been. And this interestingly parallels the work that Leon Festinger was doing simultaneously here in the United States in his cognitive dissonance research. Um, I didn't really talk about the experiments, but one of the earliest experiments for cognitive dissonance is that they would have students come in and be told that they were doing this great scientific research and then sit them down in front of a board full of pegs and tell them to rotate each peg in order a half turn over and over and over again for the next half hour. And that, but and they, the student would think that that was the experiment, but that wasn't really the experiment. The experiment was when the student left the room, they were told that, oh no, there's an emergency. One of our, our next staffer has called in sick. So we need you, If we're gonna pay you a little bit of money if you can tell the next person who's gonna do the experiment what it's all about, And but you need to sell it. You need to tell them it's an awesome experiment and it's gonna benefit science greatly. And so, um, and the, the, the turning of the pegs was designed to be mindless and boring and seem like it was completely useless for science. So you go out and you tell the person, hey, so they, they had a control group and the, who wasn't paid anything. And they had a group that was paid a dollar. This is in 50s money. And they had a group that was paid uh, $20 in 50s money, which is, I think, about $100 today. And so the group that wasn't paid, so, and then after they did that, um, sold sold about how fun this experiment was. A week later, they had what seemed like a different group of people, like the university ethics committee or whatever ethics committee would call them in and say, okay, well, how would that experiment go? Do you think it was fun? Do you think it was useful for science? And then they gauged their responses to see whether the person changed their beliefs about um, so the control group, they went in and did the survey and they, they were like, no, it was a useless experiment. It was super boring. I don't even know what this is supposed to prove. And the group that was paid $20 also wrote, this was a stupid experiment. I hated it. It was so boring. It was menial. I just, it was, oh, I couldn't stand it. But the group that was paid a dollar, the lesser amount actually said, they changed their beliefs. They said, it was a fun experiment. I had a really good time. And what they, what they found out was that, that when you're not paid enough to feel like you're doing it for the money, you'll change your beliefs as a reason for why you did the thing. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what they found out and simultaneously over in Korea that the Chinese were doing these similar experiments unethically on prisoners of war by trading toothbrushes for essays of, about how great communism was and the same exact effect occurred. Mm -hmm. So, And the other thing that jumped out to me is there's this weird situation in Mormonism where you're taught from a baby, serve a mission, serve a mission. So at least for me as a Mormon boy, and, and now I think it's boys and girls, now that girls are encouraged as much as boys to serve missions because the church was losing all its missionaries and the, and the number of missionaries was plummeting. They had to double the missionary force by letting encouraging all women to serve. But anyway, the point is from a boy, it's like serve a mission, serve a mission. I hope they call me on a mission, mission stories, mission, 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 mission. Your whole life is to serve a mission. And then you get to like 18 or 17 or 18 and they'll, they'll sort of like back off and they're just kind of wait and everybody else is going, all your friends are going, you're seeing, you know, the sacrament talks and the home, you know, the farewells and, and people are coming home and so they create this perception that, oh, well, you get to make the choice. Right. And so it's like. Why well, did I choose hmm, to go on a do mission? I, do I want to serve a mission? I get to make the choice, right? Right. But really, you've got 19 years of conditioning and pressure and expectations. And, of course, if you don't, you, the, the, you won't find a girl. A girl won't want to marry you. Your parents will be disappointed. All your leaders. This is what they've been raising you for forever. But they, there's just this moment where they back off and let you have the perception or the feeling that you made a choice. But did you really make a choice to serve a mission? I mean, really? But you feel like 
you absolutely feel like no, I I made that I made that decision on my own. But and did you have you, to feel like it, or it won't did work? Did you really? You yeah. yeah. If you feel like you didn't choose it, then the whole thing doesn't work. It, yeah. it just stops working. So yeah, yeah, yeah. So Absolutely. does the question is, can we find some quotes of the leaders acknowledging that this exists? Um, we have Richard G. Scott from two, uh, April 2002 conference. You will receive from the Holy Ghost a confirming witness of things you accept on faith by willingly doing them. Neil L. Ma uh, uh, Neil L. Anderson uh, in 2012 said, how do you remain steadfast and immovable during a trial of faith? You immerse yourself in the very things that helped build your core faith. You exercise faith in Christ. You pray, you ponder the scriptures, you repent, you keep the commandments and you serve others. And then from the family home evening resource book in 1997, no person knows the principle of tithing until he pays tithing. Mm -hmm. I have a Mormon ad here from probably from the eighties. Again, it's got a CTR ring and the caption reads, choosing the right is the only true happiness, only way to true happiness. Yeah. Yep. A testimony of tithing comes in paying your tithing, right? Yep. And that's yeah. the last slide on belief follows behavior. Okay. So that's motivated. belief follows behavior. And I do mm -hmm. think, I do think there's another A plus there. I'm not trying to pummel the Mormon church. I, I have so many mixed feelings and, and lots of love and frustration, mm -hmm. but, but the church is just, they're excelling at these points, Luna. So definitely. Yep. <laughs> Okay, public commitment is the next one. What is that? Public commitment is a very specific type of belief follows behavior. It is the act of making a commitment in front of other people. Robert Cialdini from Influence said public commitments tend to be lasting commitments. And, and by the way, this is used ethically in self-help groups and therapy when we stand up and say, for instance, in an AA meeting that you're an alcoholic and you sort of bear your um, AA equivalent of a testimony and talk about that and your you and to your sponsor you talk about and and people have talked about AA maybe being a cult I think it really super depends on like what region you're in what your what your local leaders are like in AA but it has helped a lot of people overcome addictions and do self improvement when you want to get buff you might commit I'm going to work out one time a week or what or four times a week or whatever and you tell that to your friends it, it is an, it can be a positive change agent um, but the fact of the matter is, this is how we operate. When we add cognitive dissonance to the concept of integrity, we have words becoming belief because nobody wants to become a hypocrite. Even small agreements can leverage a huge change. Um, there's situations, I think Cialdini talked about this in, in his book, Influence, where um, signing a petition can make you feel um, dedicated to that cause. Like all you did was sign a thing, but you can suddenly become dedicated to the organization that's promoting that cause. And you might send them money and then next time they ask for money. Um, but it's very important still, the commitment cannot feel coerced. So just like with belief follows behavior. Yep. I'm ready to talk, but I'm going to let you go a couple more slides before I jump sure, sure. in. Uh, yeah. We have a quote from Margaret Singer, who was one of the early researchers of these um, of brainwashing techniques coming out of Korea. And um, she said in Cults in Our Myths, as, a social as social psychology experiments and observations have found for decades, once a person makes an open commitment before others to an idea, his or her subsequent behavior generally supports and reinforces the stated commitment. That is, if you say in front of others that you are making a commitment to be pure, then you will feel pressured to follow what others define as the path of purity. I want to emphasize that, what others define as the path of purity. You will then you will think that you came upon the belief and behaviors yourself. So that is, it's so subconscious that it makes you think that you're being self-directed when really it's other people defining that morality for you. Yep. And we're all thinking about the fast and testimony meeting now. But, yep. So next slide. That's the next How slide. Yeah. Mormonism do this testimony yeah. and covenants. Yeah. Oh yeah. Covenants too. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. All the way from baptism up to uh, all the way to the second anointing but all the ones in between temple marriage and so forth. Yeah. And we're, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to talk about this, but I'm just going to, I'm just going to like say, and we are going to talk about coercion. You know, I, 
we're taught from a very young age that a testimony is is gained by by bearing it. It's so brilliant of the church to have this baked into the monthly, not just the monthly church experience, because of course there's the fast and testimony meeting once a month where members just get up and bear their testimony. And then in your family home evenings, you're taught as a kid to prepare, to bear testimony there to your family. And then you graduate to bearing your testimony in front of the group. And it's so brilliant. And I don't think it's conscious. I don't think they're consciously trying to manipulate and coerce people. But the way the system is set up, you are groomed to become a missionary for the church by learning to bear your testimony. And you do it in primary before you do it in sacrament meeting. And you do it at youth conferences and youth conferences, girls camp. They all mm -hmm. have testimony meetings where they're constantly trying to get you to make that public commitment. And then of course the mission is like the supreme culmination, but you're right. It's more than that. It's the temple ceremony where you're covenanting in front of your parents, your siblings, your children, whatever you're raising your arm to the square law of consecration, law of sacrifice, all the different covenants you make in the temple you're making with your arm to the square. And, and, and of course now the church has got this term covenant breaker where mm -hmm. they're basically they're basically saying, are you on the covenant path? Which means, are you keeping all the promises that you've made all throughout your life? Or are you not on the covenant path? Which means you're a covenant breaker. Wow, and this is cute. all this massive structure of undue influence where you were groomed to make these public commitments, that, which means your brain was wired to, to be committed to the organization and then how much force and power does that have to make you terrified to ever break away from it once you've made decades of public commitments right. and thousands of hours of public commitments. To and the what's the point of, sac of sacrament meeting? What's the whole point of sacrament meeting? To renew your covenants. So every single Sunday, yeah, the most important right. meeting of yeah. church, and, and they'll come to your house during COVID times and, and administer the sacrament to you, is to re-up re those commitments. And so you're, you're saying the prayer along with them in your mind. You're singing the hymn that's reminding you of what that covenant is. Uh, and so it's, yeah, it's there. So, uh, yeah, that's all I've got to say. Yeah, so, so many, yeah, and again, I didn't even think about the sacrament, but it's just constant it's public commitment. And they tell you that your commitment is to God, but in a number of these particular rituals, the, your commitment is to the church, right. not to God. And so that's right. sacred science coming in again, where the organization puts itself in place of God or some perfect system that they, they're interchangeable. Is it God? Is it the church? Um, so it's, yeah. It's it's not God. It's it's yeah. the corporation of the president of the Church of Jesus Christ, Latter-day Saints. Alex Beckstead, I, I, we're getting great comments, but I'm just, I've got to highlight this one. Alex writes, the opt-out moments in the temple are worth noting here. Um, you know, don't want to agree to this, just stand mm -hmm. up and face the judgment of all these people. I, I'll i just, I, I'm going to one-up Alex. How about opting out of a baby's blessing? Well, you can't because you're a baby. Well, how about opting out of of uh, getting baptized. Really? In the history of Mormonism, how many eight-year-olds have felt like they really had the freedom to say, nah, mom and dad, not you me. Can't when you're eight to an eternal yeah. commitment. And no one does, right? And, yeah. then, and then, you know, at the temple, that's the worst of all. Yeah, they give you like, they don't tell you what you're going to be committing to before you go to the temple. So there's that secrecy element. Mm -hmm. But then once you're there, you're going to be promising to literally give your very lives to the church, your tithing, your money, your whole mm -hmm. lives to the church. And and yes, they, they say you can leave, but before you sign up to all this stuff, you can leave of your own free will and choice, which creates the illusion of consent mm -hmm. because you don't even know what you're consenting to. But are you gonna, how many people are going to opt out at that moment right before you're about to do the endowment ceremony? grandparents, parents, siblings, everyone's around you, your loved ones. How many of you are going to like opt out and, and leave the temple? And so they even create the, the perception, the self-perception of consent by making you feel like you consented to something that you didn't even know what you were consenting to with the massive peer pressure surrounding you. 
It's right. it's and not intentionally too. insidious, but it yeah. is psychological. It is it is massively psychologically insidious that that system. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. So does does the church teach this? Well, let's do the church teach public commitment. Let's find out. Uh, Sheldon F. Child from General Conference in 1997 said, "We make covenants at the waters of baptism." We renew those covenants each week as we worthily partake of the sacrament. We take upon ourselves the name of Christ. We promise to always remember him and keep his commandments. In return, he promises us that his spirit will always be with us. We make covenants as we enter the temple, and we, in return, we receive the promised blessing of eternal life. If we keep those sacred covenants, covenants with God are not to be taken lightly. Lightly. What's interesting about this is the two things that we get back one of them is that we'll keep the commandments and in exchange where God will help you keep the commandments. Um, and the other thing we get is conveniently invisible and beyond the afterlife, which none of us can peer into. Um, some people feel like they may have, and I don't, I don't want to um, disparage any of those personal feelings, but there are conflicts in those reports of people who have seen into the afterlife. There are direct contradictions in those reports. So we cannot know for sure what will come in the afterlife. So conveniently, they're saying, we're going to promise you this amazing, absolutely the beyond your wildest dreams, but there's no way to prove whether or not it's actually true. So we don't, while we're committing and getting absolutely nothing tangible for it. Right. Yeah. Just a perception. Um, but I want you all to know that you were under duress as we've been discussing. These are pressures that you, that are hard to avoid that are, that have a huge cost to avoiding them. It was not, you were not informed. It was all done deceptively. You were, it was done under the threat of lost blessings and eternal punishment. And again, you're not committing to God, but to the church itself. And like I said before, the deal isn't even all that great. Keep the commit, keep the commandments and God will help you keep the commandments. All the rewards are intangible. uh, And I want you to know that you're not obligated to follow through on any commitment that you've made under deception or coercion. That's your out. You can, you can rest easy and resolve it in yourself. If you made these commitments under deception, you are not still beholden to them when you discover. And that's how contract law works in the United States. Um, it's how moral ethics, in my opinion, work. Uh, you, you don't have to follow through on something that you didn't, they weren't informed and consent to. Yeah. You, you, what do you get? You get to be a, a, a lifelong devoted servant to building the interests of the church. Mm -hmm. That's what you get. What do you give? You give everything. You give your life, your identity, your time, your commitment, your money. It's, it's a mind blowing commitment you make. Mm -hmm. There's no upside for you. There's no upside for you, except maybe a mansion in heaven, but again, the after it's it's, it's, it's always, it's always in the life. Yeah. It's always in the life you don't know you're going to have. You don't know if you get that afterlife. Nobody really knows what heaven's like. No one knows what the rewards are. And by the way, even Mormon theology makes it so everybody can get it at the end of the day. But still, what you do know you have is this life, the money in your pocket, your children, your reputation, how you want to spend your life. And that all goes to the corporation. And you think you're giving it to Jesus and to the Lord. But the money goes not into Jesus's pocket. It goes into the corporation's bank account. And then they use it to buy malls and real estate properties and investments and scholarships. $100 billion worth. And and counting, $130 billion just in investments. This church, the Mormon church, will be a trillion-dollar church uh, within the next 20 to 30 years. Now it doesn't even need your tithing. Like, that's just Mm -hmm. 7% interest. It, the, the money doubles every seven years with 7% interest. It's going to be a trillion dollar church w- uh, within the next 20 to 30 years. And that's, yeah, they could be helping so many people too. It only costs $15,000 to build a well in Africa. Um, I did the math on Twitter back a couple of years ago when one of these news stories broke and I forget it was something like 16,000 wells or something they could build with even just part of that um, money. And so um, they could, they could solve world hunger with that money right now. And they, they choose not to. And to me, that's despicable. So, yeah. And there's a really, um, there's a really vulnerable and I think poignant comment shared uh, by, by one of our 
One of our listeners, Liz, writes, my son kept, this is about the the idea of consent and duress, uh, uh, an honest and vulnerable parent basically acknowledges, my son kept saying he didn't want to be baptized, mm -hmm. but because I felt the pressure to do what was right, I persuaded him to do it. Liz now says, worst m moment ever. Again, I'm an echo, Luna, what you've already said, Maya Angelo. when you know better, you do better. Let's not spend any time beating ourselves up for how we behaved under undue influence. Right. We're all victims here. Let's now just figure out how we can do and be better going forward. And that's, exactly. that's all we can do. And that's a lot. I feel you deserve, you, you deserve yeah. a, you, it's a crowning life achievement to break free from an organization that has entrapped you with undue influence. So if all you've done is liberated yourself so that the, so that the the undue influence stops with you for your generation and for generations after you, I think that's a massive monumental achievement. I don't break know if you cycle. agree. Yeah, break, break the, the cycle. cycle. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely. So, okay, more um, on public commitment. Yeah, so there's a, I, I showed a picture of the testimony glove, which was a thing, again, after I left, but I heard people talking about it in 2008 from the friend and um, the idea of a testimony glove is that you have the five rote things that, that you say and you teach your children to say the five rote things. So testimonies are often give, given under pressure. And again, children cannot consent. I don't know the earliest age that children are taught to go, get up in sacrament meeting and give testimony, but I was three when I gave my first testimony. And in fact, um, when I was, I think, seven or eight, I think it was just before I got baptized, um, the the third ward phantom gave me a book on testimony. It was this, a gift giver, a secret gift giver in our ward. And and one day I got this book on testimonies. I still still have it because I had given a testimony that was apparently impressive or something at the age of seven. Um, it says testimonies are often not honest. The policy of bear it till you believe it makes makes you dishonest when you're telling that testimony. And again, that dissonance that the dishonesty causes people who are who want to be honest um, is part of what makes you feel the testimony eventually. No, you're literally um, told what to say. You literally mm -hmm. repeat back exactly. Yeah, what and you so like told the, to say. the testimony glove. It's got you know a picture of Joseph Smith in the first vision. So I. I know that Joseph Smith was a prophet and restored the gospel. It's got uh, Jesus. I know Jesus is uh, Jesus was our savior. And I know there's Joseph Smith again. I know Joseph Smith was a prophet. It's got Thomas Monson, who was at the time. I know Thomas Monson was a prophet. I know that I have a testimony of the temple. I, I know the temple is true, is a true doctrine. And we're supposed to say those over and over and over. And it's kind of those five points. There might be, I, I might be a, the test, the Book of Mormon. You might have a testimony of the Book of Mormon as the word of God. Um, but it's kind of those way a basket of 10 different truths that we are supposed to pull from and, and say. We're also supposed to be 100% positive in our testimonies. I've never heard anyone get up and give a testimony. Um, I don't know. The church is all right. I give it two stars. <laughs> no, it's a lot of work, but, you know, I have some friends church here. Church really hurt me there. in these ways. Yeah. And imagine... Imagine if there was a restaurant on Yelp and, or Amazon, there's a book on Amazon and you go to rate it one star because you hated it and it won't let you click one star. It won't <laughs> let you click two stars. It'll let you click five stars though. And so all of a sudden it has a five-star review. Are you going to trust the five-star review for that book or for that restaurant? Um, and or, so or you could only pick the pre-written text that it allows you to publish in the review. It's like, oh, you want right. to give us a review? Only the five-star button works, and you can only copy and paste in the text that they wrote for you to say. Exactly. Right? Yeah. Exactly. And yeah. testimonies are stated as certitude. We were taught, I was taught as a child to say, I know the church is true, not I think the church is true, or I believe the church is true, or I kind of like the church. I know the church is true. Um, the same way that I know that this pencil is real. Um, back, and that's back to the sacred science. You, you yeah. know, what do you know? No implies evidence and facts. And that's all, that's all smoke and mirrors. That's sacred science, right? Yes, exactly. Yeah. And, and no criticism allowed to. Um, and they're often wrote, so there's no room for self-expression in there. There, there are. I have definitely heard people bear testimonies where they have a specific thing. Maybe they were sick or um, had a problem in their life, and they may talk about that. Um, but it's it, back again. It's always how the church helped them, uh, and and they are often wrote for those who don't want to go free form in it. Um, they have a template that they can that they can use. 
Yeah, yeah. And then Liz writes, and if anybody says anything negative, the bishop will ask you to sit down, pass you a note, do damage control. We all saw that instance where the the young girl got up and said she was, you know, same sex attracted or a lesbian, and she the mic was shut off and she was sat down. You know, that's that's what yeah. happens when you go off script. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Yep. So does the church actually teach this? Well, M. Russell Ballard in 2004 said what we've heard in many different talks, simply stated testimony, real testimony born of the spirit and confirmed by the Holy Ghost changes lives. It changes how you think, what you do. It changes what you say. It affects every priority you set and every choice you make. Yeah, it's total. Yep. Absolutely. My, my computer is beeping. I'm sorry. Um, oh, no, it's someone, okay. Someone's messaging me. I'm going to ignore them. Um, if it was my son, I would tell him to quiet up, but it's it's not <laughs> someone else. Um, so let's see. Do we do uh, public commitment in the missionary field? And this is from Preach My Gospel in 2004. I'm sure it's in the latest edition, but that's the edition that I had. M missionaries pressure investigators to commit to read and pray to know that the Book of Mormon is the Word of God. Note that it's not to read and pray if like maybe the word the Book of Mormon might be true or might not be true, it is to know if the Book of Mormon is the word of God. They are to pray to know that Joseph Smith is a prophet. They are they, they're not to pray, is he a con man? Is he a prophet? Is he just like a well-meaning dude who doesn't actually speak for God? They're not, none of those are options here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They're asked, they're asked to attend church that Sunday. They're asked to set a time for the next visit, and they're asked to follow a commandment of the missionary's choice. The missionary gets to pick, you know, hey, you need to quit smoking um, or whatever the commandment is. You need to stop drinking coffee. Um, often, again, those outward presenting commandments, not I want you to be more honest this week. I'm not sure if they ever say that or I need you to, to love your neighbor a little bit more. It's always like the outward principles that, that they're asked to commit to. And it can't be... Uh probably stated enough they don't say read no man knows my history so that you understand the life of joseph smith before you bear pray to know if he was truly a prophet mm -hmm. they only tell you the whitewashed version about joseph smith they don't Just tell you the problems part. with the book of mormon how racist it is how mm -hmm. unscientific it is you're praying about sort of like whitewashed unidimensional uh issues wherein you're completely uninformed until after the hooks are in. Right. Yeah, exactly. So that's the last slide on public commitment. Um, any last yeah, thought? that's a, I mean, that is a, that is an a plus. I don't mean to be unfair to the church, but it's another a plus. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And again, there are ethical ways that this can work. Just stick in that oh, yeah. it's for your own, if it's self-directed for your own goals and your own benefit, then public commitment can be a really good tool to create new habits. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's, let's hope, let's hope for something better with creating dependency. All right. Well, <laughs> the church can't have you just up and leaving. So they need you to be dependent. So in high demand groups, they want to prevent your ability to leave and even prevent thoughts of leaving that can be real or imagined dependent real or imagined dependency, um, whether whether it is actually real or not doesn't matter. If you believe that it is a real dependency, then it is the same as being real. This can be physical, emotional, and or spiritual dependency. And any one of those would work, but all three is um, even better for the, for the group. Uh, and it's established often by social pressure rather than commandment. And it leads to double binds in decision making. Double binds is one we're going to get to in another talk, but it is a damned if you do, damned if you don't situation. There is no right choice that benefits you. The only choice is going to be win win for the group and lose lose for you. And for me, this is just you, you, can't, you cannot be happy without the church. You cannot be healthy without the church. You not can't. You can't. You won't be faithful to your spouse without the church. Mm -hmm. You can't raise good kids with the church. You won't make it in the afterlife. You it's won't be just moral the, or have any values. You can't be moral. You can't be ethical. It's the great plan of happiness, which implies mm -hmm. if you don't follow the plan, you're not happy, right? right. It's exactly. the great plan of salvation, which means if you don't follow it, you will be damned, not mm -hmm. saved. It is a dependence model from, from top to bottom. 
Absolutely. Yeah. So uh, here's a quote from one of the um, one of the books I read, and these are two cult researchers, Madeline Lando Tobias and Yanya Lalich. I looked up how to say her name, um, although that may not be how she pronounces it, but that's the popular way, Yanya Lalich. And they said, and I love this book, Captive Hearts, Captive Minds. There's a new edition, so you can get that book out of print. Uh, the new edition, which I have not read, is called Take Back Your Life. And it goes, the superiority of the church of the group is established through the combination of peer pressure and constant reminders of the new members weakness and vulnerabilities. The new member begins to rely on the beliefs of the group or the leader for his or her future well being, which which addresses what you just said, John, about needing the church for happiness. Yep. And I'm just going to just really quickly in the spirit of a full just uh, being willing to take criticisms. Dan Hardy <laughs> writes, John, quote, I don't mean to be unfair to the church, unquote. Smiley face, smiley face, smiley face, okay. Dan, I'm not sure if you're just joking with me or if you're actually a member of the church who's a believer who feels like I'm being unfair to the church while I'm saying I uh, don't want to be unfair to the church. And I'm just going to invite Dan. I'm, I'm okay with criticism. I'm okay with you challenging me. Dan, if you feel like the church does not meet criteria for the, the, the items that Luna has presented to us so far, mm -hmm. if you don't feel like the church is engages in creating a feeling of dependency of, of encouraging public commitment of belief follows behavior, of destabilizing people's identity, of love bombing. If you really want to have the position that that um, the church does not meet criteria for these items, I want to have that discussion with you. Bring it. I, I will bring you on Mormon Stories. I will treat you with respect. But but if you're mocking me, I want to have that conversation. And, and I've I'll been looking it. for for criticism and, and of my book, too. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> Please take, take show us. Apart. Yeah. Please, Dan, please show us how we're not being fair to the church. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You may, you, you, you may disagree with us on the church's motives or whether people are harmed or hurt. I, that, those are all fair questions, but whether or not the church engages in these behaviors, I really want to hear that argument. Okay. Luna, back to you. <laughs> all right. Yeah. And like I said, I'm up for that too. And I would love a, a critical takedown of my book too. I've been hoping for like an intellectual, intelligent, a fact-based critical takedown. Um, I've certainly gotten a lot of, you know, you're led by Satan or you're hurt and hateful or all that kind of stuff, but like an actual, someone who reads it and critiques the points I actually make. So um, yeah, so the church I mentioned can create, or a group, high demand group can create dependency in three different ways. Um, spiritual dependency. So um, the eternal, this is how the church can, can meet that. Eternal destiny is dependent upon the church. All meaning is found within the church, all your values and sense of purpose. Um, it externalizes your free will. So you're giving your ability to make choices up to the church. And so the church is basically telling you this is right and this is wrong. And if you do this, you're good. And if you do this, you're bad. And also the forever family would count as a spiritual dependency, because if you don't follow the church's commandments, then you don't get to be with your family forever. Uh, you lose out on that. The psychological and emotional sphere uh, includes social support, your family and immediate, and both immediate and extended family, whether or not you'll still have access to them or can relate to them as closely as you did before. It is your familiarity with like whether or not you're familiar with the church and the and its policies and you're comfortable with the culture. Uh, you, you, you're under threat of losing that sense of familiarity if you have, leave the church or are pushed out of the church. And your identity is also wrapped up in the church and you're dependent upon the church to preserve your identity as it stands. Yeah. And, and I'll just highlight one of those items like. We all thought growing up Mormon that the eternal family idea was the most beautiful of all ideas. It's like, this is the one great gift that Mormonism gives the world is the eternal family. But what, what you have to realize now thinking about it is it's manufactured scarcity. It's this idea. Why, why is it the default that a loving heavenly father lets everyone be with their family in the afterlife. That should be the default. And that should be just the love of God and the charity and the kindness and the ethics of God. But instead, what is perceived as this gracious, beautiful teaching of eternal families is really um, what, it, what it ends up doing is this powerful bonding 
to force you to obey and pray and conform and pressure everybody around you out of being terrified that you won't end up with your spouse or your children or your grandchildren in the afterlife. Mm -hmm. And it becomes the tyranny of the eternal family, not the beauty and the freedom of the eternal family. And it is one of the most powerful ways the church creates dependency because who doesn't want to be with their spouse and kids for eternity, right? Right. And, and some uh, people are traumatized by their spouse or, or their, their parents or their other family. And in that case, that creates a different trauma dynamic um, because now you're going to feel like you're going to be forced with a, an abusive person, but you're not having what abuse is explained to you. You're not having the, someone say that's wrong. You're just told to honor your father or mother no matter what. And so that creates a whole other dynamic for people who are in abusive situations. Like I'm going to be stuck being feeling this way for the, for the rest of eternity. So it's, it's a double-edged sword as well. Yeah. It's so often yeah. these beautiful things become really pernicious, unfortunately, when you really think about it. And Luna, I just have to take, we're, we're, we're on the topic of family. I have to share this, this uh, shout out to you. Oh. Brenda Flesher writes, I am married to Luna's brother. While I was still believing, Luna never criticized or challenged my faith. I wish I had read their book when it came out. Um, for those who weren't with us last time, Luna uses they, them pronouns as a gender non-binary identifying person. So, uh, so Brenda writes, I wish I had read their book uh, when it came out. They, meaning Luna, are so intelligent and well-researched and really believes in actual agency. Love you. Aww. Brenda. Thank you, Brenda. That is beautiful. <laughs> and Luna, I think that's well-deserved. So I had to share it. Thank okay. You. So back to creating dependency. <laughs> yeah. So physical dependency, when we think of a high demand group or a cult that has created physical dependency, we might think of like a cult compound like the FLDS or Heaven's Gate who had their own property and people were segregated onto the property or um, the Sea Org within Scientology where people uh, are sent as, as teenagers and have to live there and, and the doors are locked and there's cameras and people everywhere to keep you from running away. Um, but you might think, well, the church doesn't really have all of that, but they does actually have it in a few ways. So first of all, your safety and material blessings are contingent upon the church. I grew up with stories about how temple garments saved people from harm. Um, Tithing is fire insurance. Exactly. Uh, Tithing literally keeps you from being burned. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Fire. Yeah. We <laughs> joked about that in seminary, um, the fire insurance joke. And then financially, when you really break down, like when you think of... Uh, a white Mormon male with a career in the church. That's sort of that independent. We're taught to be independent in the church, self-reliant. Um, most of us think of that person and that person is not financially dependent upon the church unless he is working for the church in CES or for BYU or one of the other church office buildings, something like that. Also, most women in the church don't have careers and so are financially dependent upon good standing with their husband. Mm -hmm. And huge, anyone, huge. exactly, anyone living in the Mormon corridor, um, mm -hmm. which I don't know if they still call it the Morador in some circles, but that's what we did. Um, it, so if you're working in Utah or in Boise, Idaho, you have a really high chance of having a Mormon boss. If you're running a business in those communities, your client's approval may depend upon your standing within the church. And of course, minor children are completely physically dependent upon maintaining good standing with their parents. And so with when you add up all of these things together, more than half of the LDS members are physically dependent upon being in good standing mm, with the church. It's so powerful. That's mm -hmm. powerful. Yeah, the, um, one of one of our really faithful uh, listeners and followers, Jenny, she writes, I was utterly dependent mm -hmm. um, because of the Mormon church. I was a stay-at-home mom. She got a tumor, became disabled. Her husband was cheating on her with prostitutes and abusing and torturing her, but she couldn't leave because of total de dependence. And then she writes, yeah. I became homeless when I left him. When yeah. half of your population, the women, and I guess the children, two thirds mm -hmm. of your population or more yeah. for, t for, for decades and decades are a thousand percent dependent on the church through the patriarchy, through the husband, how much freedom do they really have to, to make other options, right? To, to, to make other choices. Yeah. I mean, very little. Yeah. yeah. And, and I feel for you, Jenny. And yeah, I've, I've, like I said, been with an abuser as well and was financially dependent on him. And it's uh, very, very tough to leave that. I was couch surfing for a while and, um, 
and had to, I, I, I used my retirement. My retirement is gone. I lived on my retirement. Um, so that's, yeah. Anyway. Yeah. And there, there's also the men, the psychological bonding of prosperity gospel. Mm-hmm. Oh, if you, if you serve Jesus and the Lord and the church, and if you're faithful, they'll pour out blessings. And that sounds beautiful. And oftentimes Mormons are prosperous, but that's just because they do smart things and lots of non-Mormons do smart things. But in a Mormonism, you think that your prosperity comes from the church. And what that often does is it makes people afraid to leave it because they're like, oh my gosh, I've had good things happen to me so far. If I leave it, will will my business dry up? Um, you know, will, will the Lord stop blessing me? Will I be cursed? And then there's the real idea that your business is somehow tied to your relationships in the church. And so if you're a dentist or a doctor or a lawyer or a psychologist and and Mormons are your clients, mm-hmm. there really is a financial dependence on remaining in good standing with the church sometimes yeah. as well. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. So we also have under this topic, in terms of emotional dependence, the concept of regressing, which reverts an adult into a childlike state. So when we were children, we had brains, we had the same brain that we have now. And all of these neurons were firing, brain cells were firing and creating templates, which is how our called synaptic pathways, which is how our brain works, all of our memories and behaviors and ideas and all that thing are stored as synaptic pathways. So all the synaptic pathways that we had as children, we still have exactly as children, they're dormant. Sometimes we're reminded of things by various triggers like um, childhood songs or feelings that we have, or just memories that come up. And that can actually, if, if that's, if that button is pushed enough, can put us into a regressive childlike state again um, and remind us, which, which brings us back to destabilization. It's a one way of destabilizing people. And that can make the adult feel emotionally attached and physically dependent because that's how we were as children. So I have, um, I think this slide's showing up funny on your side. I don't know why it did that, but um, I think it's because I used an emoticon or something like that, an emoji. Um, But uh, I have the lyrics to I am a child of God up here because that does remind us of our dependence. And the second verse of that song, like anytime I hear this song, I'm like right back to childhood. And the second verse of that song speaks directly to this. I am a child of God. And so my needs are great. Help me to understand his words before it grows too late. And that's a very ominous, you know, we think of this song as like a heartfelt, you know, children's song, but there's a really an ominous threat built into that particular lyric. And we have to scarcity. It's that perceived scarcity. Yeah. Act and now, out of that, now before the offer expires. Right. And to me, that has like an, a dark cloud on the horizon, like, you know, like a hor- I watch horror movies, so, you know, it'll be too late. Um, and, and the way out of that is to understand God's word. And so um, we had, lead me, guide me, walk beside me, help me find the way we end up asking for guidance from those who are in authority over us. And it's not Jesus, it's it's the leader, the prophets and apostles leading the church today. And and don't pay attention to what they said in the past, because we may have changed that. It's like, what are they saying today? And and they're leading the corporation of the president of the church, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So the next slide, we have a scripture verse. Uh, I think we mentioned this earlier. And verily I say unto you, this is Matthew 18, 30, by the way. And verily I say unto you, except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Mm-hmm. Yep. Be like a child, which means submissive and obedient and ignorant, and right? Dependent. And dependent. Yeah, as dependent. Well. yeah mm-hmm. dependent. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So we talked a bit about reciprocation in our last talk. Um, we'll hit on that again. Uh, reciprocation is a feeling that we have when we're given a gift that we feel like we have to give something back. Usually we feel like we want to give more back. And so what we've been given in the church is uh, Jesus Christ's sacrifice is the atonement, the dying on the cross, the resurrection. Uh, and he sacrificed his whole entire life for us. And so what we're going to feel dedicated to give more back. And in Gospel Principles 2001, it says, How Jesus loves us to suffer such spiritual and physical agony for our sake. How great the love of Heavenly Father that he would send his only begotten son to suffer and die for the rest of his children. They definitely push that button. I think in my book, I quoted a couple of um, 
hymns that sacrament hymns. And uh, th I, there were far more that I couldn't quote because of copyright issues. Lyrics have funny copyrights. Like if you say even one line of a lyric and it's copyrighted, they can sue your pants off. So I avoided, I had to use only public domain hymns, but you go through and read those hymns and they're incredibly guilt provoking and hit that button of reciprocity reciprocity, which does create in us a feeling of eternal dependency, not just, oh, I'm going to give back just a little bit and then I'll be done. I'll be off the hook, but eternal dependency. Yeah. It, again, something beautiful becoming pernicious, this idea of Jesus, mm -hmm. the way we were taught, you know, Jesus died for you. Like, oh, what an amazing thing, right? What a, mm -hmm. this is one of the most sacred things we all felt as Mormons. The truth is it, if it's not true, if it was just made up, then we're given this story of something that literally never happened. Mm -hmm. There's no cosmic math where Jesus died so that we could all go to heaven. If that's all made up, then we were told this story where we're supposed to feel super guilty and indebted for something that actually never happened. And then what we have to do to make that right is to give the rest of our lives to the corporation. That's a that's a, a mind blowing uh, inequity of what is given versus what is what is taken and what is received, right? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So the yeah. thing about oh, well, let me just share one comment yeah. from a listener. Mm -hmm. There's so many comments coming in. Krista writes, I too was codependent on my abusive spouse and on the church. He got to do whatever he wanted. Leaders protected him. I stayed home with five kids trying to be the perfect mom, Mormon mom. I lost myself. So much trauma to heal from. This is painful, and I'm really sorry for that, Krista. But she also writes, this is very validating. Thank you. I think that's what your book does, Luna, is that it, it's, it, this is hard stuff to like – slaying the sacred cows. Why are we doing it? Is it to like hate on the church and take everyone away from it and destroy the church? It's not. It's to help people who have been under the power of the undue influence to, to rewire their brain, to liberate them from the undue influence and to free them up to to create a new world for themselves, not rooted in John DeLynn's theology or a new guru Trust yeah. yourself, rebuild exactly. yourself, become who you want, know yourself, and then become who you want to be. That's what you're doing, Luna, with this amazing book. Absolutely. And validation is super important. It's a it's part of the therapeutic process, why we go in and talk to therapists and tell them all our problems so they can tell us, hey, that that wasn't a good thing that happened to you. That wasn't your fault um, when it when it wasn't your fault. Um, and and it also because we've been conditioned. And honestly, I really wish there was a path like this for general PTSD, for abuse PTSD, because I think that the trauma industry addresses the trauma, the brain wiring and the emotional chemistry and stuff that happens in our minds, but they don't really address deconditioning the things that we learned from our abusers about ourselves and about the world that makes us be like that. But fortunately, in the cult exit world, that work has been done. And I was able to build upon the work of others. And the, those other researchers who have nothing to do with Mormonism whatsoever, said that if you went through a high demand group or a cult experience like Scientology, like Branch Davidians, the way out of that is to to understand what happened to you, to unpack those doctrines so that you can separate who you truly are from the person that the group was trying to make you be. So that's what I'm here for. Like John, like you said, John, I don't want any followers. I don't have a prescriptive spiritual path for anyone. Uh, I'll be upfront. I do want you to buy my book because that's kind of how I'm making my living right now. I'm a freelance writer and I also sell books. Um, and it's, but once and you're it done, it will with help that, you if you buy the book because exactly. the book will help and it's you. 25 bucks and then you're done, right? Yeah. So I don't have like a whole bunch of programs. And if I did, that they would be very focused on getting you over it. And it's up to you mm -hmm. to decide when you're ready to move on. I don't want you to be beholden to me forever. I don't want you to obey me. I don't have any commandments for you. I do want you to be an upright and moral person in general, but I'm not going to tell you how to do that. And uh, I'm not, I'm not going to promise you ultimate happiness. If you follow my plan, I, I don't want you to be clinging to, to Luna for the rest of your life. I want you to be happy. Are you so, wanting 10%? Do you want 10%? Don't, 
I want 25 bucks for my book. That's all I want right now. <laughs> or if you want to borrow it from someone, I'm happy for you to borrow it. And I've got free blog posts on my website that I'm not even going to charge you for. Um, I do a lot of unpaid work in this field. If if I wanted to make money, I could make more working at McDonald's for seven fifty an hour. The book is Recovering Agency yeah. by Luna Lindsay, Lindsay Corbin. Um, Corbin. <laughs> and um, uh Thank you. Lifting the veil of Mormon book. mind control. I just wanted to be upfront. <laughs> I just wanted to be upfront that that's what I want out of people. I I don't want your whole life. I just I want you to heal and grow, and I want to be compensated for my labor, and that's it. Yeah. So. Okay. Yeah. Let's let's round out uh, creating dependency. All right. So um, under creating dependency, the promised outcomes are contingent upon good behavior. So it's not just where you're going to be dependent on us. We'll take care of you. Nothing to worry about. It's you got to keep performing in order to stay, stay in the loop. Uh, and you become dependent upon the church, even for decisions, small decisions, big decisions, all the decisions. I know I was all hung up on, you know, am I where am I going to find Mr. Right? Am I going to get married? Where should I move? Where should I live? What kind of job should I have? Should I pursue my career? Is this just a temporary thing? Like all of these little decisions. And I had a feeling that like, if, if I even woke up on the wrong side of the bed and left the house at the wrong time, that I might avoid an accident or change my life in a positive way. If, if I just did everything just perfectly and I had to be in tune with the spirit in order to do that, it, it was very dependent upon the church and, almost every waking moment of my life. I'm sure some people can relate to that. We're, con we're um, conditioned to scrutinize every tiny decision. And, and I've run across conference talks that talk about the eternal consequences of even the smallest decisions. And in cognitive behavioral therapy, which is a therapy that is highly effective for treating anxiety and depression, that is known as cat catastrophic thinking. So the idea behind cognitive behavioral thinking of therapy is that we have feelings, behaviors, and thoughts, and they all link together in a triangle. And of those three, if we want to change our behavior or change our thinking, the easiest, sorry, the easy, or our emotions, the easiest thing to change is our thinking. So the idea there is if we're, we're depressed all the time, that might be because we have certain patterns in our thinking that are erroneous. They're lies, they aren't true, and they're ramping up our emotions way too high. So catastrophic thinking is one of those thinking patterns. And it's the idea that even a tiny choice can cascade into um, this. You know, it hasn't happened yet, but we we think, oh, I'm going to be late for work. I'm going to be five minutes late for work. Oh, and then on the way to work, we're thinking, I'm going to lose my job. And then if I lose my job, I'm going to lose my house. And then I'm going to be homeless. And then I'm going to get hooked on drugs. And then I'm going to die. And that's what you're thinking. You're just building up into this huge panic. And cognitive behavior therapy teaches you to do the opposite of that. Okay, calm down. If you're five minutes late for work, there might be an immediate consequence to that, but there's no point in extrapolating that out. Well, the church teaches us the opposite. The church, like I said, there are talks where they talk about every tiny choice leading to not just lifetime consequences of maybe being homeless or something, but of eternal consequences of being spiritually homeless when God kicks us out of his house forever. And not just you, but for generations and eternities and all the posterity from and time children, and memorial, yeah. Right? yeah. Yeah, exactly. So in the antidote to this, um, and I, I wish I'd provided more antidote slides to all of these. Um, my book does go into antidotes. That's on book two. Bit. That's the sequel. That's, <laughs> That's the right. sequel. That's the sequel. So just remember, all choices have a mix of realistic consequences. There are trade-offs, both good and bad. Everything we do has good outcomes and bad outcomes in a mixture. And rarely does a single choice bring a large negative outcome. So you should trust yourself. I have uh, as evidence for my claims that the church ramps up the catastrophic thinking. I have another Mormon ad from the 80s. Uh, and it's a guy, he's standing between on a giant chess set between the black and white. We talked about black and white thinking before. And the caption said, life is no game. Every choice has consequences. So choose wisely. And that I'm going to add my commentary is wrong and controlling. And it says, make your move. Make your move. <laughs> make your move. That's right. <laughs> so what do you think the grade is on that, John? Okay. Well, you know, so, uh, you know, trying to be fair 
if we compare to like, uh, you know, Warren Jeffs of the FLDS church, mm -hmm. if we compare to Scientology where they literally imprison you, you know, there are cults that are way more severe in terms of, of, uh, creating dependency. I mean, I'm about to interview the Jehovah's witnesses. They don't even encourage their members to get educations mm -hmm. because, you know, and so, so these people are just even more dependent. So mm -hmm. I, I do think that if, if, and, and that, to be honest, that's true for, for all of these things, mm -hmm. all of these principles you lay out, you're going to be able to find uh, cults or high demand religions that are worse right. in, in any Definitely. of these dimensions, but, yeah. but, but absolutely the, the church's theology and doctrine and its practices are rife with creating not as much physical dependency, but, mm -hmm. but they absolutely get an A plus for psychological and emotional dependency. Definitely. And there, and like you said, there are definitely worse groups out there not going to argue with that, but it's not oppression Olympics. It's not like, well, you're right. oppressed less than me. Therefore you are not oppressed. This is not black and white thinking. This is a spectrum just because you can say, well, you're not quite as oppressed as that other person doesn't mean you're not oppressed. So, yeah. And again, I'm just going to say that the church being less severe, the Mormon church being less severe allows it to be bigger and more influential it allows it to have senators. It allows it to have members of the House of Representatives, which Scientology doesn't have, as far right. as I know. It allows it to have a presidential candidate for a major party. It allows it to have major circuit court justices, CEOs of Fortune 500 companies, $130 billion just chunk change to mm -hmm. invest. Because it's less severe, and that allows it to be... 16 million or 5 million versus a couple hundred thousand or a couple million. And that means more LGBT suicides, more broken families, more divorces, more wrecked lives. And so in some sense, being less severe is more leads to more harm. And that's why we can't let the Mormon church off the hook. Um, you know, even though good can come from it, you know? Yeah. Okay, and, we're yeah, on and to can come from all these groups, by the way. And that's something I haven't pointed out just real briefly is any kind of situation that you're in, even being with my abuser, I got good things out of it. So the, it's not black and white. Nothing's 100% good or 100% bad. Uh, there's there's good and bad and recognizing both of those is kind of part of healing. Yeah. Yep. All right. Emotional All right, so we're, we're on to the last one, which is emotional over intellect. I already know what grade the church is getting on this one. <laughs> and we, we have about 10 minutes. So we got to cover this one in about 10 minutes. Okay. We'll hurry. Um, so first of all, emotions. Well, are... I, let's be clear. I'm the one slowing you down. Okay. I'm okay. just going to own that. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, emotions are incredibly easy to manipulate. And I know this very well as a fiction writer. Again, well, all of these things are, can have ethical uses. So part of my job as a, as a fiction writer is to manipulate people's emotions. They're consenting to have their emotions manipulated. They're saying, I'm reading a story now. I would like to be taken on a journey. And if I'm doing my job right, I will do that. But the point is, is it's really easy to manipulate emotions by, through a lot of things, through words, through art, and also through telling stories. There's nothing wrong with emotions. We often in our society tend to focus on rationality is the most important thing. Uh, but it, but if the way to do it healthily is to balance emotions with our intellect together. Emotions, I think, ought to be classified as one of the five sense senses. I think it ought to be a primary sense. It doesn't necessarily reflect the, the valid truthfulness of literal reality, but emotions do give us feedback about our reaction to reality that can be very important and useful. Self-awareness of those emotions is a healthy skill that can help us function better in life and be more happy, reach our goals. However, because it is so easy to deceive with emotion uh, as over reason, um, we have to be careful of it. And that's where the church abuses it. So if I hold up this pencil and say, this is a pencil and it's black and it's been sharpened a few times, it's a little bit short, but it is kind of sharp at this point. Like you can see that. And if you were in the room with me, you could hold it and you could measure it and you could tell that it's a pencil. 
unfortunately, with emotion, you don't need that evidence. There's no evidence required. You just need to say a few beautiful words in the right order, and you can make someone cry, or you can make someone happy, filled with joy. It's pretty easy to do. Uh, and what that does is it suppresses our ability to think critically when we are in that state. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Emotions are powerful. Um, yeah. The, so the little cartoon is a brain that says, wait, hang on, let's think about this. And the heart says, shut up. Let's do this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. All right. Let's keep going. Emotion over intellect. All right. It suppresses critical thinking. We mentioned that um, it encourages exclusive reliance on emotion for decision making uh, and amplifies the influence of manipulators. It reinforces our trust in those manipulators and allows for easy reframing. Reframing is one of the topics that we will get to. Uh, it's where something has one angle to it and we introduce a new angle to change sort of how it looks. Uh, we will definitely talk about that more another time. Um, and we can use feelings to generate miracles or fulfill prophecy. So we will also talk about mystical manipulation, which is that idea of miracle fulfillment. Uh, it's a lot easier to generate a feeling in someone that you then say is a miracle as opposed to um, actually like curing an amputated limb. And uh, it answers doubts with more emotion. So a doubt is a kind of emotion and we can answer that with new emotions that override the doubt. And also if you control someone's sexuality, you have control over their emotions. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and all high demand religions uh, try to control sexuality in some way or another. Exactly. So the emotional control elephant in the room is the Holy ghost. So I have a picture. I can't believe I found this photo. It was so amazing of an elephant in a sheet. <laughs> <laughs> with a hole poked out for its eyes and its nose, its trunk. Uh, so the Holy Ghost is really how the church leverages emotion. The Holy Ghost is an emotion or a set of emotions. Um, my book, I really get into this, um, to how the Holy Ghost is used to replace the concept of love. Um, it, uh, there's actually a quote about a child who's who is feeling love for a new newborn brother. And uh, the grandma says that that's the Holy Spirit. It's It's love. Um, and you're, re you're repurposing that emotion for the church, for the sake of the church. I'm just going to have to say how brilliant it is that you used an elephant there. I don't know if you're familiar. I'm sure you're familiar with the work of Jonathan Haidt. And, a little uh, bit. I haven't read him yet. I've been meaning to. Okay. Yeah. So he has a book called, uh, um, uh, it's called the Jonathan Haidt. What is the book? There's two of them. There's the happiness um, one and there's one about religion. Yeah. I, I, I quote this all the time and the righteous mind yes. and in the righteous mind, he actually compares the brain to a writer on an elephant. Mm -hmm. And he says, the writer is, is like your, your moral reasoning. It's your, it's your prefrontal cortex. The elephant is your emotional brain. It's your amygdala. And he says, when when both are startled, who wins? It's always going to be the elephant who wins every single time. Basically, saying that the that the emotions are going to win out over the intellect every time. He goes on to say that we think we arrive at our decisions or our conclusions logically, but what neurological studies show is that oftentimes the the emotional part of the brain is triggered before the the reason part of the brain is triggered which shows that we we get the emotional reaction first then we use the reasoning part of the brain to simply um cherry pick the evidence or the logic that then makes us uh feel more comfortable with the decision that we arrived at emotionally and it's just beautiful that you're using the elephant to talk about the holy ghost which represents emotion and that fits in with the science from the righteous mind around the writer and the elephant and how emotion is going to trump logic almost awesome. every time, unless you're really, really careful. I need to get around to reading those for sure. Yeah. yeah. It just adds depth to it. So, you know, we've heard by the power of the Holy spirit, all things are possible and the Holy spirit whispers with a still small voice, but all things are possible with the Holy ghost because it's invisible and limited only by your imagination and, or by the imagination of the person trying to manipulate you. So it is conveniently 
suitable for all situations. One day the Holy Ghost might tell you to do X and the next day do Y. And it's all to serve the needs of the manipulator, not to serve your own needs. Yeah. And, and even the language that's used is, and by the truth of the Holy Ghost, you, you shall know the truth of all things, the mm-hmm. truth of all things. Wow. That's pretty powerful. Like scientists are still trying to find out really basic things about atoms, about germ theory, about the human brain. Oh, but with feelings, mm-hmm. you can know the truth of everything. Right. And, and that's where, that's where the Mormon church was so skilled demeaning science, demeaning the scientific method, demeaning intellectuals, um, demeaning, you know, Darwinism and, and age of the earth and geology. None of that matters. All of that can be trumped. All evidence can be trumped by feeling. It is a crucial move for high demand religions and Mormonism, cultural Mormonism is just uh, reinforced with steel beams of emotion over intellect. Yeah. And if, if you really could know the truth of all things, why didn't Nephi, you know, build satellites? I mean, (laughs) he he could know the truth of all things. So he could just build all kinds of technology. He could have invented the internet and he, he apparently didn't. So, uh, so does the church teach this? Well, Boy K. Packer in 1984 said revelation comes as words. We feel more than hear. Nephi told his wayward brothers who were visited by an angel, ye were past feeling that ye could not feel his words. The flow of revelation depends upon your faith. You exercise faith by causing or by making your mind to accept or believe as truth that which you cannot by reason alone prove for certainty. As you test gospel principles by believing without knowing, the spirit will begin to teach you. Gradually, your faith will be replaced by knowledge. Yeah. So yeah. It's so, again, that. it sounds so beautiful, but it is so manipulative and yeah. and wrong. Yeah. Here's Doctrine and Covenants 9, 8 through 9. But behold, I say unto you that you must study it out in your mind. Then you must ask me if it may be right. And if it is right, it will cause that your bosom shall burn within you. Yeah, Therefore, you shall cool. feel exactly. You shall feel that it is right. But if it not be right, you shall have no such feelings, but you shall have a stupor of thought. You're suppressing the intellect again. It shall cause you to forget the thing which is wrong. And I added an asterisk that says, may contain traces of cognitive dissonance. And I have another asterisk that says significant quantities. So we talked about cognitive dissonance. And I think stupor of thought is a really good way to describe one of the feelings that cognitive dissonance can cause is like a sense of confusion as those two ideas clash in your mind. You know, I'm going to just, I'm going to call an audible and I'm going to just read one more scripture. I know I told you that we need to hurry. If you read Moroni 10, three, you know, three through five or whatever, um, uh, that's the scripture that we're taught in seminary to memorize (laughs) because it's Moroni's promise. And it, it, it basically says, I would exhort you that when you read these things that you would, um, remember how merciful God is. That's all that guilt and the shame. Jesus has died for you. God's been merciful with you. So like the Moroni 10.3 is like putting you in that submissive state of the childlike, vulnerable, weak, fragile human. Emotional. Right? In an emotional state, making you feel sad. It's saying ponder it in your hearts. It's not saying ponder it in your mind. It's saying ponder it in your hearts, right? Which means go to the feeling place for this to know truth. Go to the feeling place. And then it says in verse 4, Moroni 10, 4, And when you shall receive these things, I would exhort you that you would ask God, the Eternal Father, in the name of Christ, if these things are not true, and if you shall ask with a sincere heart, with real intent, With faith in Christ, he will manifest the truth unto you by the power of the Holy Ghost, not by evidence, Mm -hmm. not by facts, but but by the power of the Holy Ghost, which is feelings. Which are very easy to stimulate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And by the way, because of the, what was the one where if it doesn't work, you're doing it wrong? What is that? Um, Uh, Blame reversal. But through blame reversal, anytime mm-hmm. you do Moroni 10, three through five, and it doesn't work, well, you right. didn't have enough faith. You didn't wrong. You didn't have a sincere heart. You didn't have real intent, 
right? Um, you didn't have enough faith, so it's back on you, back on you, back on you. And then the mother load comes in Moroni 10.5, and by the power of the Holy Ghost, ye may know what? You may know what, Luna? All things. The truth the of all truth, things. The truth, truth. <laughs> Of all of things. Of all things, right? It's just so freaking loaded. It's unbelievable. Okay, sorry. That was my audible. Let's get back to your quotes. <laughs> all right. So here's Second Nephi 9, 28, 29. Oh, the cunning plan of the evil one. Oh, the vainness and frailties and foolishness of men. When they are learned, they think they are wise, and they hearken not unto the counsels of God, for they set it aside, supposing they know of themselves Whereof, wherefore their wisdom is foolishness, and it profiteth them not, and they shall perish. But to be learned is good if they hearken unto the counsels of God. And of course, God doesn't come down and tell us this with words. He uses scriptures, authoritarian people who spoke in the past, and he also uses feelings, the, the Holy Ghost. Yeah. Yeah. And how, like, I sometimes I just wonder, how did Joseph Smith, like, it was so brilliant for him to bake into the Book of Mormon this anti-intellectual sort of stance with Korahor, with Nehor, with this with this scripture about the learned thinking that they're wise, the foolishness of men. Like you have to give him credit. That was brilliant to bake mm -hmm. into the book this anti-intellectualism as an antidote or as a defense to intellect that would that would you know, assault the church and say, wait, what about evidence? What about science? What about reason? It's already been baked in. The, the members have already been inoculated. Those smart people, those scientists, well, they're, they, they, they don't, it's, you know, they don't have the power of God, right? Yeah. Well, this might've been a dig too. Like I'm not a huge Mormon history buff, but at this point, hadn't he been challenged uh, by intellectuals at that point on the history? I mean, it's second Nephi. So he's, kind of a ways into working it to writing it. I don't know if he'd lost the first first book of the, you know, first Nephi yet at that point or not. Um, but he'd been challenged by people. So he would I think he was ready with his defenses based on his contemporaneous activities. Yeah, yeah. He had done enough treasure digging to to realize yeah. he people were challenging him the, the on a rational basis. And it was, you know, in the mid uh, 19th century and that rationality was kind of getting its foothold at that point in America. So, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Glenn L. Pace in 1989 said, Elder Foss describes this type of intellectual as a person who continues to chase after a bus even after he has caught it. We invite everyone to get on the bus before it's out of sight and you are left forever trying to figure out the infinite with a finite mind. And I added, but what if it's the wrong bus or what if the engine catches fire? Yeah. And there's the whole stay in the boat thing. Really? Do you want to stay in the boat if it's sinking? Like, yeah. you know, exactly. that kind of mentality. So here's the antidote to this one. First of all, you own your feelings. They're your feelings. So you get to be responsible for them, but you also get the benefits of those feelings. Feelings are neither morally good nor bad. They can, they're can they neither good nor bad in general. They are either pleasant or uncomfortable. Feelings can't be morally evil. Only actions have morals. So you can feel angry, and that is okay to feel angry. It is just a feeling. It is a sense. It's the same as when you look out with your eyes and you see colors. There's nothing morally wrong with colors. There's nothing morally wrong with your feelings. Your actions impelled by those feelings, though, if you, if you don't keep those in check, if you haul off and punch someone when you're angry, that can be morally good or bad. And again, nuance and context all matters in that. Feelings give us valuable information about our reactions and inspire us to act. So we're taking in all of this information. Our feelings are processing it and producing for us our reactions to us. That is all really valuable information. It may be factually wrong if we're afraid of something that is not actually dangerous to us, but knowing that we feel that it's dangerous is informative and useful information. And that also inspires us to act. So when we're afraid, our heart rate goes up and we're better at running and fighting. When we're angry, again, our heart rate goes up, our physio physiology actually changes with each of our emotions that can inspire us to act in ways that might be beneficial to both us and, and others. So our anger, again, I'm picking on anger because it's considered kind of a bad emotion that can inspire us maybe not to haul off and hit someone, but maybe we go out and write an article that speaks truth to power, or we stand up for our beliefs, or you know, where it gives us energy to go out and do something to try to end the wrong thing that's happening. 
Awareness, not control, is how we can live and flow with emotion. So we were taught in Mormonism to control our emotions, stamp it down, rattle our passions. And really that that causes our emotions to build and build and build and build. And then they come out in some way that we don't have control over. So what we can start with is meditation, types of meditation where we become aware of our breath and our body and where we're feeling those emotions in our body. And that can help us recognize what we're feeling and what action it's inspiring us to do. And then we can flow with the emotion. Maybe it wants us to punch someone and we shouldn't punch someone, but we can say, okay, I acknowledge that you exist feeling of anger. And I acknowledge that you're trying to tell me something important about the world. So I'm going to listen to that. And I'm going to act in a way that is, that is mutually beneficial for all of the self. And we can also learn how to trust our feelings. Yeah. And I just want to say part of what's so tricky is not only does the Mormon church, and this is back to the bite model. We've talked a lot about behavior today. Emotion is really important. We've talked about information. This is Stephen Hassan's bite model. We've talked about behavior and, and how belief follows behavior. We've talked about information, how the church hides information from its members intentionally so that they can control their thoughts that they have. And emotion is such a critical part of the bite model. And what you have to realize is, uh, high demand religions, uh, people who are exerting undue influence, they're going to get you to feel the emotion, fear or joy, and then they're going to always tell you what it means. So one of the critical parts of that is the interpretation of the emotion. You say totally correctly that your emotions are yours. Mm -hmm. I want to also say that your interpretation of your emotions should be yours and you should not let somebody else tell you ever, not a not a crystal, you know, not a Reiki person, not a new age person, not me, not Luna, not, not even a, a religious person, not a therapist, not a licensed mm -hmm. therapist, not a coach. Nobody gets to tell you what your feelings mean. And if somebody is trying to tell you that, that's your first sign that somebody's trying to manipulate and control you. Never let somebody tell you what your feelings mean that should be on you i'm sorry i just had to say that sure no it's an excellent point perfect fits yeah. perfectly in here so again this is tobias and lalich um, from captive hearts captive minds after leaving such a group you need to recognize that having human thoughts and feelings is okay instead of continually confessing or suppressing feelings you discover how to evaluate them and choose the ones you want to act upon for some former cult members, rediscovering the world of feelings is a big portion of the healing process. If this is not addressed, they may lead a narrow, unsatisfying experience. Yeah. So what's that basically doing? It's, it's sort of backing up what I just said about learning to flow with your emotions, learning to know what you feel, learning to feel confident in interpreting your emotions. And if yeah. we don't address yeah. that, we're yeah. missing out on the healing. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I'm gonna right. rush so I think you're bringing us home now. Yeah, I'm going to rush through these ones. This is actually a really big topic. We're going to see if I can do it really fast. Um, they, researchers have discovered two different types of feelings, uh, types of thinking. And we tend to react differently based on these types of thinking. We tend to assess things differently. So the first one is conf confirmatory thinking. And this is where we already have a belief and we are seeking evidence to confirm that belief. And the second one is exploratory thinking, which is mm -hmm. we have a question that we want to have answered, but it's an open-ended question. We might have some ideas about it, but we then seek out the evidence and learn what the evidence tells us about that. So confirmatory thinking is more emotional. That is what is known as hot cognitions in some of the studies. In that, we know the answer before we have the evidence. We confirm what we already know. It is more easy to manipulate people when they are in that state. It is a closed system. You will not change your mind when you are in confirmatory thinking, no matter what the evidence shows. And it embraces confirmation bias rather than trying to avoid it. Under exploratory thinking, that is more rational. It is called cold cognition in some of the studies. It decides the answers based only on the evidence, discovers new things. It is restricted only to what reality shows. It is open and can change based on the evidence and tries fervently to avoid bias. 
The next two slides actually show a flow chart that we can, we won't have time to explore them, um, but we can, maybe, we can. Maybe we can start them. with that next time. I just, sure. I want to come back to the slide because this is so important. Just yeah. ask yourself if you're in a Mormon context, if you're in anything that you're suspecting is a high demand uh, organization exerting undue control. Are, are you, do you know the, do you know the right answer before you even start asking the question? Mm -hmm. Are you trying to just confirm what other people have told you? Is it, mo is it based on emotion or is it based on evidence? I is it evidence-based or emotion-based? Is there manipulation going on? Is it a closed system? Um, you know, uh, this is just, this is just critical thinking 101. And it's, it's truly one of the life skills that we're lacking in society for political stuff, mm -hmm. for religious stuff, for relationships, for everything. And I mean, yeah. maybe we can start back up with this. That sounds good. Yeah. Cause the yeah. flow parts are kind of cool. I compare Mormonism with uh, more of a scientific approach. Yeah. I don't mind if you want to move these slides to the beginning of our next presentation. Okay. Yeah, I'll do that. Yeah. All so right. that's well, it. Yeah. Well, the, the only reason I'm rushing is because I'm doing another interview right now, back to back. The book is Recovering Agency, Luna Lindsay Corbden, uh, mm -hmm. Lifting the Veil of Mormon Mind Control. Please go buy it now. Several people just bought the Audible version. There is an Audible version of this. Please buy the print version as well to support Lindsay, but do it mostly to help unpack and heal and grow from having been subjected to a high demand religion. This is just part two of a five part series we're doing. We have now covered 12. Is that right, Luna? I believe so. Yeah. I think we did seven, uh, 13, 12, I think we 12 did or 13 of, yeah. of the 31. So we've got uh -huh. a long way to go, but this is all super important stuff for life skills, for unpacking, for rebuilding, healing and growth. So Luna, Lindsay Corbin, thank you for joining us. Thanks to all our listeners who, who have been joining us in the comments. Thanks to everyone who supports Mormon Stories. And Luna, let's have you right back and let's keep going, okay? Awesome. Thanks so much, John. It's been great. This is You're brilliant as always. Awesome. And, and uh, we'll see you again soon, Luna. And all listeners and viewers, we'll see you guys all again. Just right on the flip side, come back for part three of our, of our talk with Luna. Take care, everybody. Awesome. Thanks again, Thanks Luna. Thanks a lot. Bye, everyone.